Hi, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence on EU South America Global Governance, I would like to wel welcome everybody to the event today, to our workshop on transforming the role of international courts and tribunals in the new era of international adjudication. This event is organized by the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence on EU South America Global Governance, co-funded by the European Commission under the auspices of the Erasmus Plus program, and is also co-funded co by CAPES, our, uh, associated to our Ministry of Education. This event uh, has been organized by the center and has also the crucial support of our marketing team from FGV Today to Rio. Um, as you are prob probably aware, the center envisages um, uh, uh, the development of comparative studies on the field of global governance and beyond, and also in, in, in fields uh, such as global litigation and disp dispute settlement in general. So now I would like to pass the floor to Professor Sergio Guerra, our director of the law school, and then I'll come back to you with our keynote speech. Thank you, Professor. Good morning. <laughs> um, welcome to everyone. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here today to open, say a few words about uh, this important workshop uh, organized by Professor Paulo Almeida. I'd like to congratulate Professor Paulo Almeida for organizing everything and for bringing some uh, international scholars, Professor Serena, who is here, and other colleagues from our uh, other international schools from all over the world to participate in this workshop. You know, this event is um, a hybrid event. Um, we have some people in person and some um, people online. I greet you all with joy, everyone, here in person and, and in virtual uh, mode. And I'd like to say that um, for who is here, I was talking to Professor Serena. Uh, we have a sunny day, we are in front of the Sugar Loof, and I hope our colleagues from uh, other states, our, um, our countries, are enjoying your stay here in Rio at our law school. I have a few words to say very briefly about this workshop. Uh, our law school uh, was created with the challenge of transforming the teaching, production, and application of law in Brazil. We constantly encourage critical and creative thinking to contribute to the country's future leaders. As an international renowned think tank, FGV is committed to innovation both in teaching and most notably in research. We represent a focal point for the production of legal knowledge across cross-cutting global subjects and an international hub of reference for the understanding of Brazil's legal institutional reality. For 10 years, FGV Law School Rio has held the International Organization for E-Standardization, 9001 9, uh, quality certification, provided by the British Standards Institution and accredited by national and international accreditation bodies for certification service. So, pursuit the quality of what we do on global scale is crucial for us. The FGV Law School Rio offers several teaching programs. The postgraduate strict to sensual program, which covers the doctoral and master programs, is focused on the constant development of students' capacity for critical reflection on the regulatory uh, phenomenon. Our program fosters the engagement of the academic community worldwide and is prepared towards developing a deep and critical understanding of regulation in a broad sense. 
We also train, encourage the students to apply multiple research methodologies, include, including empirical research and working with large databases. The postgraduate program receives several professors and researchers from foreign universities to give lectures and participate in our research activities. Our program has two main research areas, regulatory governance, institutions and justice, is the first one, and the second one, economics, intervention, and regulatory strategies. FTV Law School Rio has its doors open to the world and has already become a reference as a hub of global legal knowledge production. Currently, it's important to stress, almost 15% of the current student body is composed by foreign students. Our course may be taught in Portuguese, in English, and French. Internationalization has always been our main goal or as far as undergraduate and postgraduate programs are concerned. Our students are permanently encouraged to participate in exchange programs with partner universities around the globe. Our faculty members and researchers are also constantly stimulated to de develop uh, transnational research projects with renowned research centers and institutions abroad, abroad. As of now, we have 55 international partner institutions in more than 22 countries with around 30 exchange students per year. Furthermore, the FTV Law School Rio is a member of the Law School's Global League, which represents a group of 33 universities from various countries with the aim of fostering the study of the diverse legal system in the world. Moreover, we are also part of the Latin American Link Linkage Program, which is an international mobility initiative between Latin American law schools and the AO Law School. The label of a center of excellence represents a global recognition of the quality of our curricula, as well as the excellence, the excellence of our teaching staff. The FTV Germany Center of Excellence in European Union South American Global Governance, co-funded by the European Commission through the Erasmus Plus program, aims to foster a comparative study on global governance and related subjects take into account the context and the specific demands for the global, global South. The center represents an international focal point to stimulate debate and critical thinking on updated topics under scrutiny in international forums and institutions. This workshop on transforming the role of the national courts and tribunals in a new era of uh, adjudication goes in line with the ambitions of the Germany Center of Excellence to contribute to debate concerning the current tendencies, challenges, and limits of international litigation. The second panel of the workshop will discuss important methodological issues in line with our research agenda at FGB Law School Rio. As we constantly stimulate the use of empirical methods and the use of large database in our research projects. I will now pass the floor to Professor Paulo Almeida uh, who will now say a few words on the conception of this workshop and the main ideas to be discussed today. Uh, just to finish, as the dean, I use it to open uh, some academic events. We we'll talk about that with uh, Professor uh, Serena. And, but I, unfortunately, I could attend the whole event. So thank you so much uh, for coming again. And Professor Paula, Take the floor, please. Well, I would like to start by thanking everyone uh, for being here and especially by thanking our team from the Jamone Center of Excellence who are here since the beginning you know the day and he was here for the whole night <laughs> for the last you know for the last months in order to prepare this conference and to make it everything possible the but in the best way possible okay so this is really a big thank and the recognition of their hard work in preparing this conference 
Uh, and especially a big thank to Julia Romay. Uh, she contacted everyone. She was in charge of organizing the activity here on behalf of the Germany Center, and I'm very grateful to her. Um, and I would also like to thank all international and national invited professors uh, who accepted our invitation to be here today. Notably, Professor Laurence Bosson de Chazoun from the University of Geneva. She's there online with us. Uh, she has already, she's, she's already connected. Um, and also, uh, D Professor Diego Arroyo from Sciences Po Paris. Uh, he's, uh, he's on the way, he's coming. Uh, and Professor Jean-Marc Sorel from the Université Paris en Panthéon Sorbonne. Uh, he will give his uh, speech in French as we are a multilingual and international school. Um, and uh, Professor Serena Forlacci, uh, she, she's here. She came uh, to Rio yesterday and she gave uh, a, a, an excellent lecture in the auspices of the Rio School on Global Governance, Democracy and Human Rights. And she's also here with us today. Thank you for coming. Um, Miriam Cohen uh, from the Université de Montréal. Uh, she will be uh, giving her speech online via Zoom as well. Uh, Eli Caetano Xavier Jr., uh, he's a colleague uh, working uh, here at the uh, Rural, Universidade Federal Rural uh, do Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he did his PhD at, in Geneva with, uh, with Macanio Mabeng and uh, with the collaboration of Laurence Basson de Chazou. Uh, and we have also Sean Fob from the Ludwig, Ludwig Maximilian University of Munich. Uh, Sean Fob is, is going to be part of the second panel that we are organizing this afternoon. And uh, it, will, it will deal specifically with uh, working with large databases on international courts and tribunals and on empirical legal methods. And also we'll have at the end, as the for the closing remarks, Malcolm Langford from the University of Oslo. And he'll be participating online as well. And, uh, and he will be uh, discussing the mixed, mixed legal methods in studying international courts and tribunals. So we'll see that we have uh, lots of in important, renowned colleagues and, uh, and also friends. I'm happy because I, we have the first panel with only friends. Friends and very respected colleagues uh, internationally and nationally. So distinguished, uh, distinguished professors from FGV include, for example, Rafael Tinaraj. Merci, Rafael, d'être là. Um, uh, from, the, uh, from the School of Ma Mathematics from FGV. Uh, Enrique Enes, uh, fr also from, the, from MEPS, working with us uh, in our research project regarding the WHO uh, leadership uh, in Brazil. Lucas Tevenar Gomes from the from Direito Rio, uh, José Luis Nunes also from Direito Rio, and we have other uh, researchers working with us as in in, in initiation projects, uh, undergraduate researchers such as Pedro Jateni, Rodrigo Belotti, uh, who are undergraduate st students working on specific projects, and they are working specifically on on the topic of international investment, inter investment arbitrage and the participation of non-state actors. And they are going to present uh, their research in the afternoon panel, the panel on, on working with large databases on courts. So thank you again for coming. Um, just to offer some important background before we begin, um, we'll discuss today a very important topic, which is the expanded role of international courts and tribunals in this new era of adjudication. So the new role that international courts and tribunals have been assuming in recent years. Um, international courts and tribunals, they are increasingly uh, touching upon international and domestic politically sensitive issues. Uh, recent cases being heard before international courts and tribunals, and, and in particular before the International Court of Justice, um, uh, including, for example, Gambia, Myanmar, or, or uh, Ukraine versus Russia, also illustrate what we say uh, this tendency that uh, international litigation has rarely been a matter of private concern and has been affecting uh, other part parties, not necessarily the ones involved in the conflict. 
So the more courts move into new eras of international adjudication, uh, the more appropriate it is to provide for some method of participation. Uh, in order, in, in this, in order to hear all the parties, all the interested actors involved in the process. Uh, therefore, we have greater demands for participation, for legitimacy, for transparency. Um, and this has been gaining momentum in, in recent years, not only before the World Court, uh, but also before a multitude of international courts and tribunals. It's up to these international courts and tribunals uh, and to the World Court in particular to find the balance between the state's rights and commonly aspired goals and also their role, uh, its role in addressing common interests. So we have to find a balance without ignoring the geopolitical implications of the decisions issued by international courts and tribunals. So our first panel uh, of this workshop aims to address the current challenges uh, faced by international courts and tribunals, uh, while the second panel uh, will engage in a methodological discussion on the use of large databases uh, and the empirical methods for the study of international courts uh, and tribunals. We'll end with a keynote speech, as I mentioned before, uh, by Professor Malcolm Langford from the University of Oslo on the topic of mixed methods turn in studying courts. Now, without further ado, uh, it is with the greatest pleasure uh, that I now present our keynote speech, our keynote speaker, Professor Laurence Boisson de Chazourne. So thank you again for accepting our invitation to be here, to be our keynote speaker. It's an honor to have you here, even if it's virtually, we are, we are looking forward to, to welcoming you in person. Um, so Laurence Boisson de Chazon will discuss the plurality of international legal proceedings on challenges to international adjudication. Uh, so just a few words on her, she's, the prof she's professor at the, at, at the Faculty of Law of the University of Geneva since 1999. She has been and is a visiting professor at Aix-Marseille University, at the, University uh, at the University of Paris 1 and Paris 2, at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, and at the National University of Singapore. Laurence Bosson de Chazon is a member of the Institut de Droit International. Uh, she's director of the Master in International Dispute Settlement, jointly organized by the Faculty of Law and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies. She teaches international law, law of international organizations, dispute settlement, including law of the sea, ICJ, arbitration, uh, international environmental law, and international economic law. She is appointed to the Chair of Sustainable Common Future at the Col uh, Collège de France for the year 2022 and 2023. So thank you once again, uh, Professor Laurence Basson de Chazon, for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you, <coughs> thank you very much for this very kind introduction, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I would like to thank the organizers, the Dean, and Professor Almeda for inviting me. Um, today I'm going to be speaking of the plurality of international legal proceedings on challenges to international adjudication and I'm going to share a PowerPoint. <clears throat> and it works. This is great. So, um, we I chose this, it, it, it's a topic that I've been working on for quite some time and uh, it's a topic due to the fact that we have seen a proliferation of international courts and tribunals and uh, what we can notice too and that was said by Professor Almeda is that we have uh, states and uh, non-state actors uh, have, are increasingly using the courts and tribunals. So uh, there is, there might be issues with respect to this plurality of courts and tribunals and uh, legal proceedings. Now, I'd like to start by saying that I think that plurality of courts and tribunals is an interesting characteristic of the international dispute settlement system. And we can see that it's built in the system 
uh, and especially since the first, the second part of the 20th century. Uh, since the second part of the 20th century, we've seen a blossoming of courts and tribunals of different types. And with that, uh, we've, seen, we've seen an, an ever-increasing number of uh, international legal proceedings. So how am I going to address uh, this topic? Today, I will be uh, uh, discussing first the reasons behind uh, the plurality of international proceedings. And then uh, I will be discussing uh, the tools, the means uh, for uh, dealing with this plurality of proceedings and, uh, and, and making sure that the international legal order doesn't suffer from this plural, plurality of proceedings. So with um, starting, uh, I'm going to start this presentation with two case studies just to mention them, just to see what it means, the plurality of uh, proceedings. Uh, though there are recent examples. The first one deals with uh, uh, the disputes between Ukraine and Russia. And, uh, and I think that uh, we should dis distinguish uh, two phases in these disputes uh, between Ukraine and Russia. The first phase of the legal proceedings started in 2014 with the annexation of the Crimean Peninsula and the alleged Russian support to the armed group in Ukrainian territory, particularly in the eastern Ukraine, in Donetsk and Luhansk. And uh, because of these different facts, uh, Ukraine instituted proceedings alleging violation of the International Convention for the Suppression of the Financing of Terrorism, as well as violation of the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial uh, Discrimination. So, uh, this, that was a first set of proceedings which were instituted. The second set were arbitral proceedings before Annex 7 tribunals in the context of the Law of the Sea Convention. Then Ukraine also uh, launched five proceedings before the European Court of Human Rights. And it's to be noted that uh, although Russia in July 2001 filed an interstate complaint against Ukraine before the European Court of Human Rights. Now both Ukraine and Russia have had and are still litigating against each other in several disputes before the World Trade Organization. Now, aside from these interstate disputes, multiple individual complaints have been lodged against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights. Then similarly, we have a number of investors that have initiated investment treaty arbitration proceedings against Russia. And then additionally, in 2014, a prelim preliminary examination into the situation in Crimea and Eastern Europe, in the Eastern Ukraine, was conducted by the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, which concluded that there was a reasonable basis to believe that war crimes and crimes against humanity were committed. So this is for the first phase. The second phase uh, is uh, due to um, the uh, invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, which led to a severe armed um, conflict. And the, amidst the war, Ukraine has launched a legal counteroffensive by instituting various legal proceedings against Russia. It submitted an application instituting proceedings and a request for provisional measures before the International Court of Justice under the 1948 Convention on the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide. And it, in, its pro, in its provisional measure order requested by Ukraine, the ICJ ordered Russia to suspend its military operation in the territory of Ukraine. Similarly, Ukraine has sought urgent interim measures against Russia before the European Court of Human Rights. And there too, the European Court of Human Rights has indicated to Russia to refrain from military attacks and to ensure the safety of medical establishments and other uh, elements. So 
what we see is that we have two phases with multiple proceedings. And I would like to add that uh, at the end of February 2022, the International Criminal Court Prosecutor announced his decision to seek authorization to open an, to open an investigation into the situation in Ukraine on the basis of his office earlier co conclusions arising from his, its uh, preliminary examination, but also encompassing new alleged crimes falling within the jurisdiction of the, European, the International Criminal Court. So that is an example, and I think I'd like to note at this stage something which seems to me quite important, is that states are increasingly using plurality of proceedings, even at the incidental proceeding stage, in order to obtain multiple provisional measures, orders, by different courts and tribunals for different purposes. And it's interesting in this context to note that the courts and tribunals have uh, developed rather a rather consistent jurisprudence regarding the requirements for the indication of provisional measures. And moreover, as far as the International Court of Justice is concerned, its rules say that a request for the indication of provisional measures shall have priority over all other cases. So that means that states can use provisional measures mechanisms to actively involve dispute settlement bodies to size an aspect of the dispute or ongoing an ongoing controversy, or even to prevent further escalation of disputes. It shows also that parties are increasingly realizing that the role that courts and tribunals can play in an ongoing situation. So this was for the first example. Now, the second example, it's uh, in relation to um, a dispute uh, that uh, involved Qatar on, on one hand and Saudi Arabia, the United Emirates, uh, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt on the other hand. And there, there were issues of severing of economic and diplomatic ties with Qatar and the imposition of restrictions. So Qatar instituted legal proceedings against the measures adopted by the four other countries before the International Court of Justice, before the World Trade Organization, and, we're, and in the context of the Universal Postal Union, uh, which uh, established the, the possibility of resorting to arbitration. Notably also, Qatar resorted to conciliation requests and ask for the establishment of two conciliation commissions in the context of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination. So, as we can see, there too, in this example, in this example, there are multiple of proceedings that were launched by one state against other states for different reasons. Now, what is interesting, I think, is that uh, we see that states have a menu of options at their disposal when they want to resolve with legal teams their disputes. These examples also provide an insight as to why states have been keen to preserve the choices they have and resort to them for protecting their rights and promoting their interest in the overall context of their disputes. They like plurality and they want to keep plurality. Moreover, the plurality of proceedings is often played as a lawfare strategy by states and non-state actors. So this new form of international litigation involves the breakdown of a dispute between states into multiple different disputes or discrete legal claims that are brought before different international courts and tribunals. So we have a splitting of the facets of the disputes between courts and tribunals, between different instruments. Now, what I think is that this strategy that is played out by a great number of countries has, as we could say, yin and yang features. States uh, developed this strategy 
not only to resolve the dispute, their disputes, but also to expose to the courts and tribunals or to the public the alleged cases of international law violations. So courts and tribunals are used as public forums for exposing violations of international law. Courts and tribunals in this, in this strategy are also used as uh, means for scoring political points or for building pressure on disputing parties, disputing states. And uh, you build pressure and maybe at the end you can obtain some satisfaction when negotiation, the time of negotiations come. And uh, this is maybe something to be reflected on what happened with the Qatar Quartet dispute. At the end there was an agreement and there was a lifting of the proceedings before courts and tribunals, so maybe that uh, the proceedings that were launched played a role to exercise pressure. Now, there are, problematic, there are problems with this kind of strategy. Um, it uh, challenges the effectiveness of the exercise of the judicial function by courts and tribunals, and uh, quite often, and we, we see that more and more, when a dispute is brought before a court or a tribunal, in order to adjudicate part of a claim, the courts or the tribunal may, might have to face other parts of the dispute which are not directly linked to the jurisdiction of the court or the tribunal. So there are different tools to be uh, to be to be resorted to by courts and tribunals in this context, and maybe we can come back to that. But there is an issue in terms of pressure on the exercise of the judicial function of courts and tribunals. There are other reasons also for uh, this plurality of proceedings. Um, um, for example, we have uh, in uh, international law different types of treaties. And uh, now I'm looking at the economic disputes. Uh, um, if you look at investment disputes, you're going to see, to see that the claimants can be um, direct or indirect claimants, if they are both direct or indirect uh, investors. So that means that, for example, you can have different entities within the same corporate structure that can be protected as investors for a single investor. So there's a chain and this is maybe a challenge for a court or a tribunal and we should think about the means and we'll discuss that, the means for addressing this issue of the plurality of claimants in the context of a similar dispute. Now there is also, um, there are also other issues that I'd like to address and it's uh, on the screen, the last point is that when we, call, we speak of uh, the plurality of proceedings, the plurality of courts and tribunals, uh, we should also integrate in this context of international plurality the domestic courts, because often the domestic courts are going to be used in this kind of lawful strategies. And uh, I would like to give uh, an example. This is in relation to the Enrica Lexi dispute between Italy and India. And while uh, uh, Italy instituted international legal proceedings before the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea and then an Annex 7 arbitral uh, tribunal, both Italy and India had also instituted proceedings before their respective national courts. It's in, it is interesting to note that uh, the Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, in its order on provisional measures, ordered both states, Italy and India, to suspend all courts proceedings and refrain from initiating new ones. And there, Italos was thinking mostly of domestic proceedings. So we see that we have this plurality of proceedings, we have these various reasons for launching, for having, asking, uh, set, uh, uh, bringing uh, new proceedings before courts and tribunals. And the first remark that I'd, left, I'd like to highlight is that we see that judicial actors, 
and I'm going to speak of the judge, but it means the arbitrator or the judge of an international court, um, is asked to play a prominent role. And uh, what I've termed it, it's, it's the, they are asked, judicial actors are asked to play the role as guardians of the fabric of international dispute settlement by ensuring the, its coherence through co coordination. And uh, this is a difficult task, but more and more we see that courts and tribunals are proactive in this sense. And um, this is uh, played, this is exercised, this proactive role of the judicial actors in a context of our hierarchical relationship between different courts and tribunals. And I'd like just to mention what the uh, International Tribunal and Yugoslavia said about this uh, hierarchical, um, uh, hierarchical uh, relationship between courts and tribunals. It said international law, because it's, it lacks a centralized structure, does not provide for an integrated judicial system operating an orderly division of labor among a number of tribunals. So that means that there is no hierarchy except if you have a special regime which is providing for this hierarchy. But we're speaking, uh, we li we're leaving aside these specialized regimes, we're speaking in general, in general international law. And that means that you can have different situations. And for example, a states might be tempted to uh, use one judicial mechanism with bringing an award or decision of another, another court uh, or tribunal. And I just want to mention uh, uh, the Ambatielos case, which was brought before the International Court of Justice, uh, and it's a case which involved Greece and the UK. And there the court, I think wisely, had concluded that uh, an, uh, an arbitration agreement according to which they were under an they were the court was had, didn't have any jurisdiction, do, did not have jurisdiction to decide about an arbitration agreement which uh, was saying that the two states uh, had an obligation to resort to arbitration. So this shows that, uh, and that courts and tribunals have been aware of this plurality, but uh, the question is that, um, do we need other means for that? Do we need to have other tools for addressing this plurality of uh, proceedings? So. Um, I think that I would first like to say that uh, we need other tools, we need other means. It's very good that uh, courts and tribunals are proactive, but they have to have means tools at their disposal. Um, and why do we need them? Because I think that there are risks associated with plurality. I've listed them on the screen. Uh, the one of them is the risk of conflicting interpretations. It has not really happened so far, but it could happen. Um, there is also, if we think of uh, uh, issues of remedies, the, the risk of double recovery, uh, which I think should be addressed. There is also the issue that uh, it seems to me that access to justice and the rendering of justice are public goods. But if you play with the plurality, there might be an increase of the litigation cost, and this can be a burden for some country, for, for some uh, countries and some parties. Um, there might be also an issue of uh, legitimacy uh, because of the risk of uh, uh, plurality proliferation of proceedings. So, um, how to? address and what could be the tools that could be resorted to for that. And there I think that uh, there are different ones. At the, a fair question, and I'm going to say that directly, is that are they sufficient? <laughs> Should they be reviewed? I think those are fair questions and uh, it seems to me that there is some research to be conducted on this uh, in this area. The um, Aside from the fact that uh, I'm not going to speak of the tools that are listed there, I just want first to speak about the fact that courts and tribunals, as I've said, are aware of the situation and they have developed a dialogue among them. 
And I think this dialogue is very important to stress. Um, there is cross-fertilization among them. I referred uh, a while ago to uh, the conditions for ordering provisional measures. It's interesting to see that this cross-fertilization has uh, uh, reached a point where we have a sort of harmonized regime uh, with respect to provisional measures nowadays. Um, and it seems also to me that this dialogue is important because it uh, it can nurture the reflection of some specialized courts which might not be well equipped for dealing with different issues of international law. But aside from uh, this dialogue, there are other tools. And the first set of tools, uh, I call them this, uh, it's the ab initio tools. It's when uh, states um, have um, so identified these tools uh, in the constitutive instruments uh, containing dispute settlement mechanisms. Uh, you can think of uh, uh, an instrument like the WTO, for example, uh, which speaks of exclusive jurisdiction. Uh, so the ab initio, that means that you have specific provisions or um, there is also the possibility of an election clause, or called also the electa onavia, a clause that you can find in trade regimes, in investment regimes. I think they are quite interesting uh, because uh, that means that uh, uh, you can't go before different courts and tribunals. You have to choose one, and once you've chosen it, you can't go to another court or tribunal. Um, there is also, it seems to me, at the stage, the ab initio stage, as I've called it, uh, the possibility for uh, speaking about the good faith requirement. And um, I think that's a role for courts and tribunals to assess the good faith requirement when bringing a case before, uh, before it. Now, it's uh, not an easy task for a court or tribunal. Sometimes it's specified in, uh, in a treaty. And I'm thinking, for example, of the CETA uh, treaty, which is the European Union-Canada um, Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, where you have examples of, uh, of, uh, of good faith uh, requirements which are specified in the treaty. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be for a court or a tribunal to maybe discuss the issue of estoppel, abuse of rights, or uh, also deciding that uh, uh, it's a frivolous claim that has been brought before the court or the tribunal and it is in a position to dismiss uh, this claim. But as we've seen in the case law of the International Court of Justice, it's not an easy task for a court or a tribunal to decide about this uh, good faith requirement, and especially at the jurisdictional stage. Now, we, um, we have other tools, um, which are, the, these, these tools are going to play when uh, legal proceedings have been instituted, and there we are going to, I'm just going to mention some tools which are familiar to you. The first one is uh, res judicata, okay? And it means that uh, uh, a case um, can't be reopened if uh, it's the, the subsequent case has the same object, the same legal grounds, and the, and the, and the same parties are concerned. So you have this uh, three conditions that have to be complied with, and I like what the court said about res judicata, uh, when it said, in fact, we have res judicata because we need stability of legal relations, and there is a need for coming to an end in the case, uh, in, a, in the context of a dispute. Now, this is an interesting notion. I think the, the great difficulty with this notion is um, how to interpret it and how to apply it, and some consider that it's a bit too restrictive in the way it has been interpreted so far. The second um, tool, the list pendants, is also known to, to, to you. And um, there too, we have the three elements that have to be fulfilled, conditions that have to be fulfilled. The, the parties must be the same, the cause of action should be identical, 
the object of the dispute should coincide. Um, and that means that it's quite restrictive, it's quite difficult uh, to, to be in a position where you can have such uh, a situation. And then looking at the practice, and I've mentioned what the Permanent Court of International Justice said in 1925. I think what the court said in 1925 should be, what I say, a bit more, a, a bit relaxed, liberalized, because uh, we have now courts and tribunals of different types. And we also have quasi-judicial mechanisms which can, which can play a judicial role. And I want to refer in this context to what uh, ad hoc judge uh, uh, Jean-Pierre Cotte said in his dissenting opinion in the Qatar versus the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, uh, in the context of proposal measures when he said we need also to take into account the diversity of the courts and tribunals that are at stake, but also include judicial and quasi-judicial bodies. But uh, Will he be heard? I don't know. And it's also something, I think, to be thought. So, we have this means. Now, other tools are known to you. Those other tools are non-binding. They are discretionary. They are the disposal of courts and tribunals. It's for them to decide how to address judicial cooperation. Um, one example is... Uh, Committee, I think it can play a role. We know it's through the Mox Plant case. Uh, I've put the uh, saying of Judge uh, Wolfram uh, before the um, uh, at the UN, uh, before the legal advisor uh, of the member states of the UN, when he said judicial committee among courts and tribunals should encourage them to cooperate and to act rigorously within their own jurisdictional powers. Now it's a strong call. Will it be heard? Um, not sure. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's for a court to decide because it will entail that the court will maybe decide to suspend the proceedings. There is another uh, tool which is linked to committee, which is connexity. Connexity is known also in domestic systems, such as the French system, for example. And there it's uh, when it's, we're not speaking of the same disputes, but there are related questions in different proceedings. And, uh, and, and uh, maybe sometimes it would be important to take into account that uh, these related issues should be dealt with uh, in, a, in a comprehensive manner. Uh, otherwise, there is a risk of a contradictory decision. And there, I gave you the example where Australia in the Timor in the Australia Timor uh, Timor Leste case uh, in relation to the Timor Sea, uh, Australia pleaded uh, the connexity, saying that uh, what was asked uh, by Timor Leste in the conciliation proceedings was li was linked to what was addressed in the context of arbitral proceedings, but there it was interesting to see that the. Uh, conciliation Commission considered that there was no issue of connexity so that the Conciliation Commission could go ahead. But as you see, we have different types of tools, uh, certain ones which are procedural, legal, uh, which uh, res judicata, is pendants, other ones, other ones which are mostly discretion discretionary and which are falling on the the shoulders of courts and tribunals, they have to decide. And if they decide that there is committee or connexity, they may have also uh, to, to they, will, they may decide to suspend proceedings. So it's quite a dramatic decision to take. Lastly, I think that we should already also be mentioning uh, the role of informal uh, cooperation among courts and tribunals. Um, the example I'm giving you is uh, related to two cases which took place in the context of the Law of the Sea Convention, uh, which uh, they involved. Uh, one dispute uh, involved Bangladesh and India, the other one involved Bangladesh uh, and Myanmar. Uh, the dispute between Bangladesh and Myanmar was brought before ITLOS, the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, uh, the other one before an Annex 7 tribunal. And it's interesting to see that uh, 
the Annex 7 decided that uh, not in order not to create a mess in the context of a dispute which had some, they had links, this dispute among each other, they were deciding about issues that were related. Uh, the Annex 7 said it, that it would be better to wait uh, and to be able to consider the judgment of Itlos before deciding its, uh, the, the, the dispute that was brought before it. So with this, I'd like to conclude. Um, I'd like to say that, uh, once more, um, I think it's a choice, this plurality of courts and tribunals um, made by states, and I don't see any sign for addressing this issue because I think that states are quite satisfied with uh, the issue of plurality of courts and tribunals. But it means that if we have a plurality of courts and tribunals, we're going to have a, a plurality of international proceedings. And as I've shown you with the two examples that I mentioned, states are using this plurality of courts and tribunals with launching international proceedings for different reasons, different purposes. Now, as I've said, I think that there might be difficulties, there might be some problems, and for that, uh, how to address these problems? One, is, one way it's uh, through the judicial dialogue between courts and tribunals, uh, otherwise it's through procedural law tools, and I've mentioned them. Um, now, is it sufficient? And there, I'd like to conclude with uh, the fact that it seems to me that uh, States like the plurality of courts and tribunals, but they also, I think, have to put some order into this uh, area. And uh, I think that they are the architects of the dispute settlement system, and they should bear responsibility at the time of the drafting of treaties. And uh, I say so, for example, in the context of international economic law, where I think that states have to take the responsibility for drafting clear provisions addressing this issue of uh, risk of plurality of proceedings and risk of contradictory uh, decisions. Um, they are also users as parties before courts and tribunals, and it's also for them to use the courts and tribunals, but to use them in accordance with certain principles of international law. Um, states are the architects, but also I'd like also to, of the system, but I'd like also to mention the fact that they are users and they are litigants, and they are not the only litigants. I would like to mention uh, uh, the non-state actors, which are more and more um, present on the international scene, and um, it seems to also to me that non-state actors like this plurality of courts and tribunals, but um, there is a need to. Uh, not abuse the system, not abuse the plurality and, and the need for acting in good faith. And that the big problem I think today is uh, how to define this good faith criteria, this good faith parameter. So with that, I'd like to end and I'd like to thank you very much. And I'm very sorry not to be in Rio de Janeiro today with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Laurence, uh, for this insightful presentation, which has given us a lot of food for thought for the discussion that we may now have. Um, you dealt with, uh, with a hot topic and with uh, the challenges that international courts and tribunals are currently facing uh, with the example of recent cases uh, being heard before international tribunals such as Ukraine, Russia, and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, uh, OIA, Bahrain and, and Egypt. Uh, these cases, as you mentioned, they demonstrate the uh, use of multiple proceedings in different courts and tribunals and the challenges therein. Uh, and also the reasons uh, behind plurality and what you mentioned, the role of, of domestic courts and the role of judges in addressing such issues. 
uh, including, for example, the, uh, what is interesting, the lawfare strategy, as we are witnessing nowadays uh, in Ukraine, Russia, and, um, and, and the need to have tools. So uh, you asked whether we should have tools to address uh, plurality of proceedings. And I agree with you, uh, and, and uh, you address the need to, to avoid these risks. So the tools would avoid the risks associated with plurality. And it was interesting to, uh, to, to see you mentioning, for example, legal, rule, legal tools, choice, choosing formal ab initio, treaty provisions, uh, good faith uh, requirement, coordinating multiple proceedings with Harris Judicata, uh, Lispendent Judicial Cooperation, Connexité in formal dimension. So um, these were all, all, uh, all these topics are being discussed nowadays uh, and the possible solutions, for example, judicial dialogue, how are we engaging with uh, judicial dialogue, how far can we go in terms of procedural tools, uh, procedural reforms, uh, how are we going to take into account the role of non-state actors in international dispute settlement, so uh, we couldn't have a most comprehensive keynote speech. So thank you so much for this. We are very grateful and very happy to have you here online. And we are, we really, we are really anxious to have you here in person uh, for next events that we organize. So thank you again very much. Um, so now we'll proceed uh, to panel one on international courts and, and tribunals' current challenges with the participation of Diego Fernandes Arroyo uh, from Sciences Po. Diego, uh, please. Uh, Jean-Marc Sorel from, from the uh, Université Paris en Panthéon-Sorbonne. Serena Folati from the University of Ferrara and Miriam Cohen. I uh, would like to invite Professor Diego Fernandes Arroyo and Professor Serena Forlati uh, to the floor, please. So after, this, after presentations from, the, uh, from our, our distinguished guests, we'll have uh, space, we'll have 30 minutes for the Q&A so that everyone will have the opportunity to ask questions and to participate. Please. Now, the first presentation will be addressed by Professor Diego Arroyo on the topic of the legitimacy challenge of international commercial arbitration. Um, thank you, Professor Arroyo, for accepting our invitation to be here today. And I hope this is really the beginning of a, of a fruitful and extended cooperation between Sciences Po Paris and our Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. Professor Diego Arroyo, just to say a few words, his, his professor, his, he told me just to mention that he's professor at Sciences Po, but I, I would like to say a few more words, uh, if you allow me. <laughs> so uh, he's professor at Sciences Po Law School in, pa in Paris, where he is the director of the LLM in Transnational Arbitration and Dispute Settlement. Uh, he is a member of the Curatorium of the Hague Academy of International Law. Uh, a member of the Institute of International Law, the Secretary, uh, the Secretary General of the International Academy of Comparative Law, and a former president of the American Association of Private International Law, the ASADIP. He is a member of the Argentinian delegations before the UN CITRAL. He has also represented Argentina and Nazadip uh, before the Hague Conference of Private International Law, the Organization of American States, and UNIDROIN. He is actively involved in the practice of international arbitration as an independent arbitrator and expert. A former professor at the Universities of Litoral, Salamanca, and Complutense de Madrid, and a global professor at the New York University, has been invited uh, in a number of universities in Europe, the Americas, Asia, and Australia. The University of Buenos Aires and National of Cordoba have award awarded him as honorary professor. Professor Fernandes Arroyo is author of numerous publications uh, published in more than 20 countries in the fields of private international law, comparative law, international dispute resolution, international arbitration, and global governance. It's an honor to have you here. <laughs> so you may now have the floor. So it, it's up to you.
Bom dia a todos. Pode me dar ao menos o papel para começar. Tá. Ok, um, it's, it's for me. I'm sorry, I started in, in Portuguese. Uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be here, in, in particular to be associated to this uh, great uh, project conducted by, by my dear friend Paula. Um, and it's always, uh, it is not really a secret that it's always a pleasure uh, being in, in Rio de Janeiro, but in particular, to be with friends and, and, and to have the opportunity to, uh, to talk in this prestigious um, international center is, is, uh, is a, an honor really for me and I am very grateful for the invitation. Um, Paula asked me to talk about the, the um, uh, international commercial arbitration from a particular perspective, which is a perspective that we could call, uh, in the good sense of the of the term, we we could call um, a political point of view, and this political point of view of arbitration is a center somehow center somehow uh, somehow linked with the um, problem of legitimacy, legitimacy the the context of legitimacy in which arbitration is embedded and the legitimacy of arbitration uh, itself. So in, in 15 minutes, of course, not um, much that I can say, but I, I, will, I will try at least to try to, to, to pass a couple of messages on, on this. The first one, it is very easy, so I am not inventing anything that it is quite uh, um, obvious is that the, the context in which um, international commercial arbitration, modern international commercial arbitration was created um, is practically uh, disappeared. Uh, it is no longer uh, present. So uh, we have worked when this we is an, in a also, as in the United Nations, no, we the people, we the, uh, when I said we, I am saying all the world, the um, international organizations, uh, many actors, created a system within a context wi which was quite particular. So the, the modern um, international commercial arbitration consolidated in the last quarter uh, of the last century um, was the result of a process which started at the beginning of the 20th century. And in, in that process, um, it was, uh, first of all, a kind of reivindication of the private. So private started to be important at the beginning of the century and there are many international law features at that time that if you are more or less in acquaintance with, with international law, either private or, or public, you surely know that. I will not talk about this, but that was an, uh, that started to, to, to um, uh, emerge many manifestations of private uh, actors, private activities within the context of international law in general. And more than that, private international law um, consolidated in the first years of the 20th century a kind of, in my opinion, regrettable, but in any event clear, uh, independence from his uh, big brother, public international law. Mm? So um, at that time, uh, we had uh, the um, creation of some institutions foc uh, focused on, on private issues within the um, ambit of public settings, for example, the, the, the Hague Conference on Private International Law in, at the end of the 19th century, 
uh, the UNIDRA, the Institute for the Unification for uh, of Pri International Unification of Private Law, uh, in already in the 20th century, and private institutions very powerful outside the public settings and I would like to mention in particular in this context of international commercial arbitration the International Chamber of Commerce with its particular branch the International Court of Arbitration. Making a very long and, and uh, particular story uh, very very short um, if, you, if we go to the second part of the last century, we have a very active uh, ICC, International Chamber of Commerce. I know that uh, for public international lawyers, ICC is the International Criminal Court. Uh, but uh, you can be sure that the International Chamber of Commerce is much more powerful than the former. A and uh, it, it maybe it's, it's, it's a pity, but it's, it's like this. And um, uh, instead, uh, the, the attitude of the International Chamber of Commerce was instead of work for the development of international commercial arbitration, that there were already several instruments, important instruments, in particular, maybe you, you know or you heard about the, the Geneva um, instruments in, in, in the 1920s. Um, the, the ICC uh, decided to uh, enter to, to start to work not outside of the international regime, the international um, uh, constellation of organizations, but inside and hand in hand with the uh, United Nations, in particular with the United Nations Commission for International Trade Law. We cannot understand the modern, we cannot understand the modern uh, international commercial arbitration without the work of United Nations. So all the elements, that what it is a very long to, to explain, but I am sure you, you know that, um, all what we can characterize now as the elements of the modern international commercial arbitration, and we can say the reasons for the success of international commercial arbitration is specifically uh, based on this cooperation and we can say on the instruments adopted by the United Nations. You know surely the New York Convention on 1958, um, the model law, the, the model law on international commercial arbitration 1985 uh, and, and revamped in, in 2006 and the um, international uh, arbitration rules, arbitration rules of UNCITRAL adopted for the first time in um, 1976 and with a new um, recent version mm, of the last decade including rules of transparency for investor state um, arbitration etc. So United Nations United Nations from the very beginning, from the very beginning, we can say in the aftermath of the Second World War, decided to embrace the necessity of a private resolution of transnational disputes and to take that as a, a fundamental element, fundamental element for the peace, which is uh, perhaps the, the main goal of the United Nations. No, the, the idea that um, promoting a good and efficient system of mm, settlement of disputes, a private system or, or mechanism of settlement of disputes is a tool, an effective tool to get more peaceful relations between nations. Um, within this framework uh, of instruments promoting arbitration, and when I say promoting, but let me make uh, between brackets, uh, because I, I am sure that some of you maybe I am not totally familiar with the New York Convention, 1958 New York Convention. But uh, when you heard the name, no, there's a uh, uh, New York Convention for the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards, you may think, if you are not familiar with this, you may think that it's a typical 
instrument uh, setting uh, uh, number of rules in order to regulate the effects of decisions taken in one country in other countries. Just a neutral instrument, as many we know in uh, regards of, uh, uh, of um, um, judgments, no, in, in judicial decisions. But it's not that. It's not at all that. The New York Convention is not a neutral convention. It's a convention uh, with the aim, and not, it's, it's not something to interpret or to, to read uh, between lines. It's clearly, clearly set up, clearly said that the New York Convention is there for promote the recognition and enforcement of foreign judgment, uh, foreign arbitral awards. And it's making a way, I will not mm, become very technical, but there are two or three particular technicalities that make this convention an instrument, mm, an instrument for assuring the enforcement of arbitration agreements and arbitral awards. So it's totally different. It's not neutral. It's not just, well, we have a regime and we look at what we do with that. No, no, no. We have a specific regime to promote, to promote. And the exception is the no recognition of enforcement. The rule, the general rule, very, very broad, is the recognition of enforcement. And in addition to that, that um, instrument, the New York Convention, has been adopted by, if I am not mistaken now, uh, 172 countries. So that it is the worldwide system. Mm? The worldwide system is a system in which an, uh, uh, a decision taken by a uh, Brazilian professor, a uh, uh, Singaporean lawyer, and, and another professor from Italy sitting in, I don't know, in Mexico City, that decision is much more powerful and, and it is um, possible to uh, enforce in, in the vast majority of the cases all over the world, practically, in, in 171 countries. Mm, um, that is not comparable. There is no a decision, a judicial decision of a domestic body or international body, which that force, that it is not possible even compare. That give us a, 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 a dimension of, of what uh, arbitration is, the power uh, of arbitration, uh, for the good and for not necessarily for the good. Um, success of arbitration, well, there are many things. I, I will not uh, stop in each of that, otherwise we will have uh, several hours to talk, but just look at these elements. These elements are the elements that characterize the it's the stage of arbitration now in the majority of countries of the world. That was in the beginning in some countries and Western countries, but that is now the case in uh, practically all Latin American countries uh, with the extraordinary leadership of Brazil, um, which is one of the countries of the world with more cases of arbitration and more high profile cases of arbitration. Um, the attitude of court is largely favorable to uh, arbitration. That means that the court uh, routinely uh, enforce foreign awards, reject application for annulment. That is the general rule. Of course, there are other cases in which uh, an award is not effective, but the vast majority are effective. And the most important thing, and, and I will center on, on this in order to go uh, already to the to the end, the most important thing is the fact that arbitration has occupied the center of the sin, and that is from a political point point of view very important, um, and that is that is neutral. So I am not making uh, uh, an advertising in favor of arbitration. I am saying something that is totally. Um, we can say the neutral is an observation of the reality, is that for international commercial disputes, 
and in particular for some time, in part, and more in particular for the high-level international commercial disputes, arbitration is practically only, practically in practice, is the only means for the settlement of disputes. There are other possible, but the, 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 the users uh, don't go to the other. So, of course, you can go to courts, you can go maybe, I don't know, to, to, to use mediation or other, but uh, the, the actors go um, automatically to arbitration. All important businesses nowadays uh, include an arbitration, an arbitration clause. And that has provoked also a, a kind of mm, uh, uniformization or harmonization of the regime all over the world and a, a perception that that, that that business is a great, great success. Um, there are challenges of the success, of course, and that is uh, the, 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 we can say, the political element uh, of the speech. There is, a, um, um, from a public perspective, and I say a public perspective, uh, I am using the, the word public in a very large uh, mean um, there is a perception uh, regarding investor state arbitration as a, if not bad, at least dark and at least uh, not very fine or fair issue. And I have here the the the, the honor to have a grand, great specialist of this very point, uh, the professor Eli uh, Schooner with is there. Um, yes, uh, defended an excellent PhD uh, in, in the University of Geneva some months ago. Um, there are many people, when I say many people, you may, s may think that they are just individuals or political parties or NGOs. No, but there are the, the, the entire uh, European Union is trying to fight uh, with a relative success against this particular means of arbitration, which is the arbitration for uh, settled the disputes between states and investors. And the argument, the argument of very basically explained, the argument, uh, I am trying to, 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 to be fast before the, 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 the room um, be totally empty, the, um, the argument is legitimacy in the following sense. Legitimacy is because the topics submitted to investment arbitration are of such an importance, are, are related with human rights, environmental issues, um, um, public economy, uh, et cetera, et cetera, social rights. It's so important, the topics, that that cannot be uh, left to private deciders. That is basically the idea. I am not sure that is a good idea, but that is the idea, and the Euro Euro European Union is, and when I say the European Union, I say with all the, 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 the force of the institution is fighting um, um, clearly against investment arbitration. For users, and that is also a, in a very large sense also a political criticism, the users in, in, of international commercial arbitration, which are mainly companies and in particular important companies doing businesses in, in, in an international level, um, they mm, are in particular complaining, or they have been complaining in the last years because of, um, in particular, the length of proceedings and the cost of proceedings. So the so repeat uh, criticism ag against arbitration. The states, uh, even if they continue to promote international commercial arbitration, are, are um, of course aware of this movement, of this backlash uh, against arbitration, so they are trying to First of all, stop the expansion of arbitrability. So, before all, all the, the trend was all matter can be submitted to arbitration. Now the state is saying, well, no, maybe that matter. No, maybe consumers is better. No, mm, 
uh, labor contracts, uh, maybe not, and, and uh, there are some issues that are, are being, in, in some state at least, um, red trade from, from this progression, material progression of, of arbitration. Uh, they are much more controlling that in the, than in the past. Uh, the decisions, in particular, uh, from the, the, the perspective of conflict of interest, so the, the fact that arbitrators uh, must be uh, very clean in order to, to act as arbitrators and cannot confirm, you know, have a confusion with other roles. Issues of corruption, not corruption within arbitration, but corrupt, uh, corrupted businesses which are submitted uh, to arbitration. Um, the courts are trying to, to take a part of the business by creating a special courts dealing with the same topics that are normally submitted to arbitration. The organizations in particular, in particular the UNCITRAL is trying to answer all these uh, worries of the, uh, of the users, of the states, uh, of the international community. And even the arbitral institutions, uh, the arbitral institutions are, are in this moment are approving um, uh, rules of arbitration with very short proceedings, of, or at least offering short proceedings, limiting cost, um, trying to um, uh, introduce in arbitration transparency that was never the case, for example, the, the most cosmopolitan and important um, institution of arbitration, the ICC Court of International Arbitration, which is the headquarters are in Paris, um, has introduced something that is revolutionary in, in within this context, which is the uh, default rule of publication of awards. So now, unless both parties are against the publication of, of the awards, the awards are systematically published by the ICC. Uh, the, the ICC also published the, the names of the arbitrators and by saying in the case, in, in the sector of the case, and who appoint the arbitrator. So that we are, and other institutions are doing the same. So there is, uh, try, the, the, the institutions are trying to, to, to put more drops of accountability and transparency in what they are saying. I don't know if it's too late, that can change. For the time being, arbitration is still very, very successful, but they need really to, to, to be aware and to take actions in, in order to, to continue to be an effective and attractive way to settle disputes. The other thing uh, very important that the institutions are doing is the promotion of diversity. There was a traditional criticism vis a vis arbitration that all the arbitrators were from Europe, from the United States, um, all were men, uh, aged men, white men, and that is, uh, of course, it is, I cannot say that uh, that's totally changed, but that is changing a lot and very quickly, fortunately, uh, and in particular because of the, the work of the institutions. So, I finish. Uh, we are um, we are witnessing the the, the 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 end of modern arbitration. I think, even if the the answer um, uh, may uh, sound as um, pretentious, I, I think that that this is the case. So what we have now, or what is emerging now, is a kind of postmodern arbitration which must pay attention to many things that were neglected in by 30 or 40 years in which we had this mm, growing up and, and, and rise of arbitration all over the world. And it, I think it's, maybe it's a good thing. It's a, it's a kind of a pendulum movement. No? We, we were the, uh, from an extreme to the other extreme and we are reaching a, a virtuous center uh, and maybe it's, it's, it's a very good, uh, it's a very good thing. And uh, there is something that, step by step, everybody is realizing, which is that the arbitration is not just a mechanism that only, only is important for the two or more parties in dispute. That was traditionally the the the, the, the belief when when we think an arbitration. And it's not the case. And arbitration taking into account this 
quasi exclusive uh, role in settlement of mm, important kind of disputes, in particular high profile international commercial disputes, um, is a key element of global governance. And, and that means a very good thing from, for arbitration, and, but on the other hand, means a very mm, important, a great responsibility in terms of legitimacy, coherence of the system, uh, promoting diversity, um, accountability of the actors, etc., etc. So the, I, I think that, that, is, that cannot be for free. So the, the success cannot be for free. You must pay something for that, and I think that is the price. And uh, finally, uh, it's a kind of existential um, question for arbitration. Arbitration must uh, uh, decide if it wishes to be MUA house, so to, to date of success, or to be Lady Gaga reinventing herself all the time. And, uh, changing the, the, the path in order to continue with that success at every time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego, for this valuable contribution. Uh, some of our students are leaving because they have classes afterwards, but they will come back. Um, uh, so just to, uh, just to bring uh, here some of the important points you addressed, for example, uh, the emergence and consolidation of modern arbitration and the success of arbitration even in Brazil. So this is something that uh, you address the tendency uh, of, uh, for a quasi-exclusive arbitral jurisdiction, the transnationalization of arbitration, and, and the challenges which are very important. For example, from a public uh, perspective, uh, you mentioned that, that there seems to exist a negative uh, impact of investment arbitration, uh, and thus the political and ideological factors and the legitimacy arguments brought before the EU, um, how the users are acting um, and in face of these uh, challenges, and how courts are trying to uh, cope with this and uh, trying to find ways in order to address the challenges. For example, the tendency to stop the expansion of arbitrability, as you mentioned, the intention to control uh, proceeding, the, creations of, the creation of specialized courts, um, and how could we uh, react by looking for um, efficiency? How could we ensure efficiency and uh, transparency and so on? Um, uh, so uh, you, you uh, perfectly addressed uh, the new role of, of uh, international arbitration uh, or the new tendency of international arbitration because now are we, are we, uh, uh, are we going towards the end of modern arbitration and you mentioned the idea of, uh, of a post-modern uh, arbitration. So exactly in line of our discussion uh, in the first panel. So thank you so much for this uh, for your contribution. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us. And now um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Jean-Marc Sorel from the Université Paris 1, Panthéon-Sorbonne. Uh, uh, you are there? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Professor Sorel, for accepting our invitation to be here and to speak about l'usage politique de la Cour internationale de justice. Uh, as you know, this is a bilingual workshop, and I'm very happy to welcome you for a lecture how to be held in French. Um, so, Professor Jean-Marc Sorel was my former PhD supervisor, um, and, uh, and he's uh, a very dear friend. Uh, c'est vraiment un grand honneur uh, de vous accueillir à la, à la FGV, uh, même si c'est de façon virtuelle. On espère pouvoir vous recevoir en personne une prochaine fois. Donc, comme vous le savez, j'admire beaucoup votre travail et j'espère pouvoir vous recevoir en personne uh, au plus vite. Uh, uh, prof Professor Jean-Marc Sorel is the president of the French Society of International Law, de la Société Française pour le droit international. Uh, he's professor at the Sorbonne Law School, Université Paris 1, and former director of the IRDS, the Research Institute in International and European Law at the Sorbonne. 
He holds a postgraduate degree in public law and political science, a PhD in law and an aggregation de, uh, des universités. He teaches general international law, international litigation law, legal analysis of territorial and maritime conflicts, the law of international um, uh, organizations, the law of uh, international monetary and financial relations, fields in which he has published several uh, books and articles. He is also a lawyer and counsel in cases before the International Court of Justice. Professor Jean-Marc Sorel, as I told you, will present his contribution in French. Uh, Jean-Marc Sorel, uh, s'il vous plaît, je vous invite uh, à regagner le floor, <laughs> the floor. <laughs> Thank you. We can't hear you. Uh, on vous écoute pas. Si vous pouvez, uh, oui. I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Oui. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Merci. Thank you very much, dear Paula. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you, even if it's, uh, you are in Brazil and me in France, unfortunately. Um, uh, at first, uh, I had understood that um, we could speak uh, in. Uh, our own language. But uh, then I realized that everyone is speaking English uh, except me. Uh, as um, I did not have the time to prepare my communication in English because I was in Asia last uh, week and I will be in Peru next week. Uh, so I'm going to speak French and I apologize. And I, I have only uh, 15 minutes, so uh, uh, it will be a summary of what I want to say uh, about this topic. Just for Diego, uh, between Amy Winehouse and Lady Gaga, I'm sorry, but I prefer uh, Amy Winehouse. <laughs> um, um, donc, je vais vous parler de l'usage politique de la Cour internationale de justice, euh, tout en remerciant euh, une nouvelle fois euh, Paola, qui est une, une très chère amie, euh, pour euh, ce très intéressant workshop, et j'espère euh, revenir à Rio, comme je suis déjà venu plusieurs fois, euh, une prochaine fois. Euh, alors, l'usage politique de la Cour internationale de, de justice, c'est un thème qui tient de l'évidence, euh, tout en comportant une forme de non-dit. Bon, voilà, on ne veut pas parler d'usage politique de la Cour, mais tout le monde sait que la Cour est soumise à un usage politique. Alors, par usage politique, euh, bien sûr, euh, j'entends euh, la manière dont la Cour peut servir à des fins politiques ou... Euh, euh, de servir des fins politiques, mais encore une fois, contrairement alors au français, le terme politique est unique, euh, mais derrière politique, ce n'est pas un mauvais mot, euh, c'est le soubassement matériel du droit, tout droit est politique, donc euh, qu'il y ait un usage politique de la Cour internationale me paraît absolument naturel dans l'ordre du droit international. C'est euh, la raison pour laquelle je vais euh, l'énoncé euh, désormais. Alors, je pense qu'il y a plusieurs euh, niveaux d'usage politique de la Cour internationale de justice que je vais simplement résumer. Euh, le premier niveau, c'est sans doute celui de la structuration et de la composition de la Cour, autrement dit, en grande partie de l'élection des juges. Euh, le deuxième niveau, qui est bien sûr le plus important, euh, c'est celui des affaires portées devant la Cour internationale de justice. Et le troisième niveau, qui là aussi est très connu, euh, c'est celui de l'usage politique des décisions rendues par la Cour internationale de justice. Donc tout ceci, encore une fois, en résumé, parce que nous sommes déjà un petit peu en retard. Euh, alors, l'usage politique de la Cour dans sa structuration et sa composition, euh, je pourrais l'illustrer à travers euh, cinq points principaux qui sont très connus de vous tous. Donc je vais aller... Euh, rapidement. Euh, lorsque l'on veut être juge devant la Cour internationale de justice, euh, il faut d'abord être sur la liste de la Cour permanente d'arbitrage et on sait parfaitement qu'à ce niveau existe déjà une lutte alors, que l'on peut qualifier de politique puisque bien souvent des tendances euh, s'affrontent. Euh, il y a une lutte à l'intérieur de chaque État euh, de manière à choisir les personnes qui peuvent se trouver sur la liste de la Cour permanente pour devenir euh, juge. Alors c'est un aspect de politique interne, mais néanmoins c est, ceci est déjà politique. Euh, deuxième point, euh, la question là aussi très connue, de la répartition géographique entre les États du monde pour l'élection de juges. Et là, on dépasse le cadre interne, mais on est dans le cadre régional, dans le cadre 
Donc, euh, des régions qui sont déterminées pour l'élection des juges, selon la répartition géographique. Et je prendrai simplement comme exemple euh, un, une question très délicate qui a touché euh, l'Amérique latine euh, récemment, c'était la question de, euh, de l'élection du juge à la Cour internationale pour remplacer le regretté euh, euh, juge Consado Trindad. Et, et on sait très bien qu'il y avait candidat argentin, candidat brésilien, et qu'il fallait, bon, finalement, une forme d'entente entre le, euh, le Brésil et l'Argentine. Peut-être que d'ailleurs, ceci euh, va se définir euh, par l'élection d'un euh, prochain juge. Mais finalement, comme on le sait, c'est le juge Leonardo Brandt qui a, du Brésil qui a donc euh, été élu. Euh, troisième niveau, là, encore plus large, euh, d'usage politique ou euh, de politisation euh, de la structuration de la Cour, c'est bien sûr, là aussi c'est très connu, euh, la question de l'élection du juge entre d'une manière concordante entre l'Assemblée générale et le Conseil de sécurité, avec cette fois-ci euh, une priorité qui n'est pas une priorité de blocage pour le Conseil de sécurité. Bon, tout ceci s'est relativement bien passé, mais on a quand même eu l'épisode de 2018 avec la non-réélection du juge britannique Greenwood, euh, qui euh, marque, à mon avis, un aspect très important, c'est la première fois, donc depuis euh, la création de la Cour après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, euh, qu'il n'y a pas euh, un juge qui représente un État membre permanent du Conseil de sécurité, en sachant que d'ailleurs ceci n'est euh, nullement inscrit dans nulle part, ni dans le statut de la Cour, euh, ni dans la Charte des Nations Unies, euh, mais que ceci <rire> était un aspect euh, bien euh, connu. Et c'est bien sûr un aspect hautement politique euh, de la Cour internationale de justice. Euh, quatrième point, là aussi connu, euh, les juges doivent représenter les grandes formes de civilisation, les principaux systèmes euh, juridiques du monde. On sait à cet égard que euh, ce n'est pas tout à fait vrai, d'abord parce qu'il existe de multiples systèmes mixtes, mais surtout parce que, euh, même si politiquement on n'est pas forcément d'accord, mais ça c'est un autre problème, euh, il existe des systèmes juridiques théocratiques ou de droit divin à travers le monde et ceux-ci ne sont pas représentés parmi les juges de la Cour et on sait que là aussi, euh, l'usage qui pourrait être fait de la Cour internationale euh, dépend un petit peu de cette représentation. On a eu anciennement euh, un problème assez important bon, dans une affaire entre le Qatar et le Bahreïn euh, en matière de droit de la mer, un arrêt maintenant ancien qui a plus de 20 ans, euh, donc euh, où euh, le Bahreïn, au départ, refusait une justice qui n'était pas appuyée sur euh, la euh, charia. Enfin, euh, également, cinquième point, dans une moindre mesure, mais euh, c'est la question du juge ad hoc. Là aussi, on va faire un usage politique de la Cour internationale à travers le juge ad hoc, même si euh, la décision du juge ad hoc, euh, le vote final, n'a jamais modifié le vote global euh, de la Cour euh, dans son ensemble, euh, et on sait parfaitement que les États vont souvent désigner le juge ad hoc qui n'est pas forcément un national, en fonction finalement euh, de euh, l'influence que ce juge pourra avoir euh, sur l'ensemble de la Cour internationale. C'est la raison pour laquelle on trouve assez souvent comme juge ad hoc euh, d'anciens juges, voire d'anciens présidents de la Cour internationale de justice, dont on sait qu'ils vont avoir sur leurs collègues euh, une influence non négligeable. Donc ça aussi, c'est un usage politique quelque part de la Cour. Je pourrais y agiter un sixième point qui est, qui est un petit peu différent, euh, mais c'est une autre forme de combat politique, qui est celui de la, fa la place des femmes euh, comme juges à la Cour internationale. On sait que la première n'a été élue qu'en 1996, et Mme Higgins, et on sait qu'aujourd'hui, il y a quatre femmes sur les 15 juges, euh, donc on est loin de la représentation équitable des hommes et des femmes, tel que défini par le statut de, notamment de la Cour pénale internationale. Il y a donc une forme d'usage politique de la Cour qui commence, à mon avis, par la structuration de l'organe de jugement et par le choix de ses juges. Deuxième point, l'usage politique de la Cour par les affaires portées devant celle-ci, c'est un point évident, évidemment. Je rappellerai ou je ne rappellerai pas la célèbre définition d'un différent juridique donné dans un vieil arrêt de 1924 sur les concessions Mavromatis en, en Palestine. Euh, un différent est un désaccord sur un point de droit ou de fait, une contradiction, une opposition de thèse juridique ou d'intérêt entre deux personnes. Je voudrais simplement faire remarquer que dans cette définition célèbre, il est question de désaccord sur un point de droit ou de fait 
et une contradiction, une opposition de tâche juridique ou d'intérêt entre deux personnes. On n'est donc pas exclusivement dans un différent qui aurait une teneur juridique au départ, et euh, il est bien évident que les États vont l'entendre de cette manière, parce que les querelles qu'ils vont porter devant la Cour du point de vue juridique ont bien sûr un soubassement qui est souvent un désaccord beaucoup plus large que le point de droit qui est évoqué. Donc la Cour est d'ailleurs souvent confrontée aux reproches de trancher, de devoir trancher les différents qui sont avant tout politiques. C'est un reproche classique et bien souvent euh, l'État défendeur va contester la compétence de la Cour sur cette base, sur le fait que le, la question n'est pas juridique. Et on sait également pertinemment que euh, la Cour internationale a un argumentaire qui est extrêmement rodé euh, sur euh, finalement cette question euh, du cumul d'un différent juridique et politique et qu'elle va très bien extraire euh, les aspects juridiques d'un différent politique plus large. Je renvoie pour cela, à mon avis, à un arrêt euh, bien sûr très important en général, mais également sur ce point-là, euh, qui est le célèbre arrêt de 1986 sur les activités militaires et paramilitaires au Nicaragua et contre celui-ci, où euh, les États-Unis contestaient euh, le caractère juridique, bien sûr, de la question, et où la Cour a réussi à ramener ceci sur un aspect très euh, juridique. Alors, pour illustrer ceci, je vais m'arrêter juste à une question euh, actuelle, c'est-à-dire quelles sont les affaires pendantes aujourd'hui devant la Cour internationale de justice. Il y a en fait 17 affaires au contentieux et une demande d'avis consultatif, donc inscrite au rôle de la Cour. Et si on regarde ces affaires, on s'aperçoit que euh, toutes ont finalement pour objectif un usage politique de la Cour internationale. Euh, qu'on sent évidemment avoir le temps de les détailler. Vous avez deux affaires entre l'Iran et les États-Unis. Si vous regardez ces affaires vous vous apercevez que ce sont des points de droit précis qui sont portés devant la Cour, violation du traité d'amitié, du commerce et de droit consulaire, les actifs iraniens également, mais chacun sait que derrière ces points-là, c'est évidemment une querelle politique et que celui qui va gagner sur ce point de droit aura l'impression de gagner politiquement. Bon, vous avez deux affaires qui concernent le crime de génocide, bon, l'affaire ukrainienne et l'affaire Gambie-Myanmar, Bon, là aussi, des affaires qui, évidemment, ont une teneur politique. Je vais y revenir dans un instant pour, pour l'Ukraine. Vous avez trois affaires qui portent sur la Convention internationale sur l'élimination de toutes les formes de discrimination raciale. De nouveau, une affaire qui concerne l'Ukraine et la Russie portée avant l'agression russe de février 2022. Et les deux affaires croisées, Azerbaïdjan-Arménie, et Arménie-Azerbaïdjan, et on sait pertinemment que derrière les violations alléguées de cette convention sur l'élimination de toutes les formes de discrimination raciale, il y a évidemment des enjeux beaucoup plus vastes. Une fois de plus, celui qui pourrait gagner cette affaire aurait un avantage politique évidemment très important. Idem pour les affaires qui touchent les immunités. On en a deux actuellement. Une qui est le rebondissement de l'affaire Allemagne-Italie. L'autre qui est le rebondissement de l'affaire entre la Guinée équatoriale et la France, là aussi des aspects extrêmement politiques. Si on prend l'affaire Guinée équatoriale-France, on sait pertinemment que c'est une question qui oppose la France et la Guinée, mais qui oppose aussi les juges français à la Guinée, avec des soubassements politiques très importants. Quant à la, à la Palestine, vous avez deux affaires actuellement, une au contentieux, bon, dont euh, évidemment, euh, inutile de vous dire que celle-ci euh, est un peu en retard, et l'autre qui est l'avis consultatif, le dernier porté euh, devant la Cour euh, en janvier 2023, donc euh, récemment, et euh, ces deux affaires sont évidemment éminemment politiques, puisque dans l'affaire au contentieux, au-delà de la réponse que la Cour pourrait donner sur le fond, si jamais elle donne une réponse sur le fond, euh, c'est évidemment l'aspect compétence de la Cour qui va être très important. Parce que la Cour ne peut juger que des États. Et si la Cour dit « je suis compétente pour l'affaire Palestine-États-Unis » qui concerne le transfert de l'ambassade de Tel Aviv à Jérusalem, eh bien si la Cour dit qu'elle est compétente, elle dit que la Palestine est un État. Inutile de vous dire que euh, ceci a un retentissement évidemment important et que l'usage politique de la Cour, là, me paraît plus qu'évident. 
On trouve également, toujours à l'heure actuelle, des affaires plus classiques euh, des différents territoriaux ou maritimes, mais essentiellement d'ailleurs euh, maritimes. Mais si vous regardez bien derrière euh, l'aspect classique de ces différents, là aussi, on, a, on est devant des États qui sont souvent dans des situations de tension. Je pense à l'affaire Nicaragua-Colombie, bon, euh, en matière de droit de la mer, j'allais dire une des affaires, parce que le Nicaragua euh, apportait énormément d'affaires devant la Cour. Vous avez également l'affaire Belize-Honduras, Guyana avec Venezuela, ou l'affaire Gabon-Guinée équatoriale, là aussi euh, ayant un, un soubassement euh, politique. Alors, sur 10, 18 affaires, euh, 17 au contentieux une demande, d'avis consultatif, quasiment aucune affaire n'échappe à un cadre politique et à la volonté pour l'État demandeur d'utiliser politiquement la Cour pour un différent plus large. Il en va de même, évidemment, pour les avis consultatifs, mais peut-être ceci est encore plus important dans l'abord politique euh, que les États, enfin que les États ou que euh, ceux qui posent euh, l'avis consultatif, qui posent la question, souhaitent obtenir de la Cour. On le sait très bien, ces avis consultatifs sont utilisés essentiellement pour des territoires qui ne sont pas des États, mais qui voudraient bien être des États, et ont fait transiter finalement des questions juridiques, va via l'Assemblée Générale. Bon, c'est évidemment le cas pour le dernier, la dernière affaire ou le dernier avis demandé par la Palestine, mais vous pouvez pratiquement prendre les 28 euh, avis consultatifs rendus, tous ont une teneur politique très importante. Que ce soit ceux sur le sud-ouest africain en son temps, ce sur la Palestine, puisque l'actuel n'est pas le seul avis demandé, bien au-delà, euh, et euh, on a eu l'affaire notamment sur la, la question du mur en, en 2004, que ce soit le Sahara occidental, que ce soit le Kosovo, que ce soit l'archipel des Chagos, mais même d'autres affaires, je pense euh, à l'avis de 1954 sur les effets des jugements du tribunal administratif des Nations Unies, c'est quoi la question La question c'est le macartisme. Hein, c'est donc euh, cette espèce de chasse aux sorcières euh, aux États-Unis. Euh, pour certaines dépenses des Nations Unies en 1962, c'est évidemment la question de la création des obligations de la de la paix et l'opposition d'État à ces créations. Et je ne parle pas de la question de la licité de l'utilisation des armes nucléaires euh, par un État dans un conflit armé. Bon, donc toutes ces affaires là aussi euh, ont euh, finalement pour objectif euh, que la Cour serve à certaines fins politiques. Si on prend d'une manière plus ciblée euh, euh, deux affaires actuelles, mais je les prends euh, un petit peu au hasard, mais c'est peut-être les plus célèbres, euh, l'affaire donc euh, Ukraine-Russie et euh, Gambie-Myanmar concernant le génocide, bon, l'affaire Ukraine, euh, et si on prend le cadre euh, de l'intervention, vous savez qu'il y a deux types d'intervention devant la Cour, l'article 62 et l'article 63. Bon, l'article 63, ce sont les déclarations que les États font en intervention pour donner une interprétation donc d'un certain traité, en l'espèce de la Convention sur le génocide. Jamais il n'y a eu autant de déclarations d'intervention devant la Cour. Il y a eu 32 déclarations concernant 33 États, puisqu'il y a une déclaration commune entre le Canada et les Pays-Bas. À ceci s'ajoute d'ailleurs, euh, dans un autre cadre, les renseignements fournis par l'Union européenne, il y a évidemment une forte dimension politique et un usage politique de la Cour qui dépasse très largement euh, le différent précis et qui est en faveur de la paix de la sécurité internationale que cherche à défendre euh, les intervenants. Et la Cour subit à cet égard évidemment une très forte pression politique euh, pour qu'elle se prononce dans le sens qui est souhaité. Pour l'affaire, l'autre affaire de génocide, celle entre le Gambie et le Myanmar, finalement nous avons également un cas de figure euh, non pas similaires, parce qu'il faut quand même remarquer que là, il n'y a pas eu euh, de déclaration d'intervention des États euh, au titre de l'article 63, ce qui est sans doute un petit peu dommage, mais euh, on est dans un cadre également d'utilisation politique de la Cour par euh, la manière dont on essaie d'amener euh, euh, l'action publique mondiale, l'action populariste, euh, qui signifie que n'importe quel État du monde peut dénoncer une situation de génocide, ce qui, à l'inverse, pourrait créer d'ailleurs un excès d'utilisation politique de la Cour euh, si de nombreuses affaires de ce type-là euh, se posent. Enfin, et je serai rapide parce que j'ai déjà un petit peu dépassé mon temps, euh, il y a l'usage politique des décisions rendues par la Cour. Là aussi, c'est évident. Alors, c'est évident pour l'État, bien sûr, qui a gagné, qui va utiliser politiquement cette victoire, mais c'est évident également pour l'État qui a perdu. L'État qui a perdu, parce que parfois l'État qui a perdu sait qu'il va perdre. 
mais il va l'utiliser pour montrer finalement sa bonne foi politique, sa bonne volonté. Je pense à une vieille affaire, à une époque où euh, cet État était loin d'être euh, finalement euh, dans les, dans les, comment dire, en odeur de sainteté euh, dans la communauté internationale, c'est l'affaire entre le Tchad et la Libye, euh, en arrêt de 1994. La Libye c'est pertinemment qu'elle va perdre. Elle, elle, elle propose néanmoins un compromis au Tchad pour amener l'affaire devant la cour. Elle perd effectivement euh, 15 voix contre une, et c'est la seule voix du juge ad hoc de la Libye qui a voté pour la, la Libye. Mais le colonel Kadhafi, euh, à ce moment-là, veut rentrer dans les bonnes grâces de la communauté internationale et se sert quelque part de cette défaite pour montrer sa bonne foi d'avoir réglé devant une juridiction, donc devant un tiers impartial, un conflit qui, il faut bien le dire, était un conflit euh, armé euh, entre les deux États. Les exemples peuvent être multipliés, c'est le cas pour l'affaire entre le Cameroun et le Nigeria, euh, même pour l'affaire entre la Macédoine et la Grèce qui a permis de débloquer euh, cette question du nom euh, de la Macédoine, aujourd'hui Macédoine du Nord. Euh, C'était également le cas euh, pour euh, les, euh, la question concernant l'obligation de poursuivre ou d'extrader entre la Belgique et le Sénégal, qui a finalement amené, obligé politiquement, le Sénégal à créer une juridiction spéciale pour juger euh, Issenabré. Et c'est même le cas dans des affaires de moindre importance, dont l'une que j'ai relativement bien connu, l'affaire entre le Cambodge et la Thaïlande pour le temple de pré -Avière. Bon, la demande en interprétation, euh, l'arrêt rendu en 2013, donne raison au Cambodge, puisqu'il demande à la Thaïlande de se retirer d'un certain pays périmètre, mais comme l'interprétation se base sur le dispositif de 1962, et que ce dispositif ne mentionne pas la frontière, en 2013, la Cour ne définit pas la frontière, ce qui est logique. Et la Thaïlande peut dire « mais on a gagné » puisque la frontière n'a toujours pas été définie. Donc on voit bien qu'il y a même un usage d'une certaine forme de défaite. Et euh, je prendrai également comme dernier exemple euh, l'obligation relative à la cessation de la course aux armements nucléaires entre les îles Marshall, le Royaume-Uni, l'Inde et le Pakistan. Bon, on sait que la Cour ne s'est pas reconnue compétente, certes, mais on voit bien comment cet échec va provoquer après devant l'Assemblée Générale la signature d'un traité euh, bon, qui, à mon avis, euh, va rester euh, partiel, mais quand même 122 États, euh, sur l'interdiction des, des armes nucléaires, qui par essence est une solution radicale, j'allais dire, à l'échec un petit peu des îles Marshall devant la Cour internationale. Et c'est encore plus vrai pour les avis consultatifs, on va utiliser les avis consultatifs euh, à des fins politiques très clairement, avec ce que j'appelle un système autobloquant et un effet de cliquer. Bon, l'avis consultatif n'oblige pas mais il empêche. Il empêche, par exemple, il empêche le Maroc d'annexer le Sahara occidental, parce qu'il faut un référendum, et la Cour l'a dit. Il empêche Israël de considérer que le mur en Palestine est une frontière, puisque la Cour a dit que c'est une simple barrière de sécurité, comme vous-même vous le dites. Euh, il permet, peut-être malheureusement cette fois-ci, euh, à la Russie de se targuer de l'avis consultatif sur le Kosovo pour finalement reconnaître l'indépendance d'État fantoche en Géorgie et bien sûr aujourd'hui en Ukraine, où il va gêner également la France pour l'archipel de Chagos, puisque finalement l'archipel de Chagos ressemble quand même beaucoup à ce que la France a fait pour les Comores en séparant Mayotte des autres îles des Comores. Bon, alors en conclusion, la Cour confirme finalement que ce que tout le monde sait ou devrait savoir, il n'y a pas de barrière infranchissable entre le droit et la politique, c'est même l'inverse qui doit être constaté en droit international. Tout différent est issu d'une querelle politique et se transforme en droit. La Cour confirme que le droit pur est finalement une chimère. Elle a toujours su séparer les éléments juridiques et les questions éminemment politiques. Et l'usage qui est fait de la Cour internationale et de ses décisions, la Cour en est tout à fait consciente. Et c'est à mon avis le simple reflet de la nature profonde du droit international. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, professeur Jean-Marc Sorel, pour cette présentation. C'était vraiment très intéressant. Bon, j'adore vous écouter, euh, en tout cas. Et, euh, et je voudrais dire que votre sujet, le sujet qui, qui, que vous avez présenté, c'est vraiment très, comme les étudiants le savent ici, c'est très actuel. 
so I'm going to switch to English just to, to address a few comments. Uh, so this is very natural to speak about the, uh, e the political use of the uh, International Court of Justice, as Professor Jean-Marc Sorel has mentioned. So this political use um, uh, has been used by states uh, in order to activate the court's jurisdiction and also uh, when applying the decisions uh, rendered by uh, international courts. Uh, Professor Jean-Marc Sorel gave some examples of the election of judges to the court, um, the, the role of the states and the possibilities of blockage uh, uh, and of, of political you know, decisions uh, being made by uh, political organs uh, when electing international judges to the court and the, uh, the judges ad hoc as well. Uh, and uh, it's interesting to see, as Professor Sorel mentioned, that there are several pending cases before the uh, international Court of Justice, now 17 uh, uh, contentious cases, and all of them, as he mentioned, uh, all of them touches uh, upon uh, political issues or have at least uh, political issues as a background. Um, so they all, they all testify this use of this political use of the International Court of Justice. And Professor gave some examples uh, such as the genocide cases, uh, the cases involving racial discrimination, uh, and also the, uh, the uh, territorial maritime disputes. So all of them, uh, as he said, aucune affaire n'échappe au cadre politique. Uh, right, so they, and this is even more, more uh, evident for the, uh, co for the advisory opinions uh, issued by the ICJ and now being submitted to the ICJ, such as the WO2 and, and the, uh, the advisory opinion on, on climate change. Um, uh, and this is also true whenever we, uh, we, we apply this, uh, these advisory uh, opinions in order to, uh, to ensure a political uh, objective. Um, and uh, Professor Jean-Marc Sorel uh, mentioned, and this is something that uh, Professor Laurence Boisson uh, in our keynote speech has also addressed, it's the lawfare strategy in order to pursue a political pressure uh, before the international courts and tribunals. An example of this is the, uh, is the, is the intervention uh, requests made by more than 30 states in Ukraine-Russia case before the ICJ. So there we can identify several uh, challenges uh, and how to find a balance. Uh, is it advisable to control th this political use of the court? Um, Est-ce que cela est souhaitable? Est-ce que cela est possible? So in any case, um, this political use of international courts and tribunals demonstrates that uh, states are willing to use international adjudication uh, because international courts, they have legitimacy. So it's, in any case, it's a positive phenomenon, I could say. Um, so th all this uh, to say that uh, Professor Jean-Marc Sorel uh, discussed a very hot topic and this is something that we are discussing nowadays with uh, these cases that prove uh, the political use of the court. So thank you once again. Merci encore une fois, Jean-Marc. Uh, merci beaucoup. J'espère vous avoir ici prochainement. Et, uh, et ap on, après, uh, bon, après les autres présentations, on aura uh, Q&A, so space for questions. Um, and then we can address questions in French uh, or in French or in English, right? Okay, uh, in French or in English, so both. Uh, so thank you once again for uh, for this interesting insights. So now I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Professor Serena Ferlati, Professor of International Law and Head of the Department of Law at the University of Ferrara in Italy. Thank you again, Serena, for accepting our invitation to be here today. Um, and uh, Serena is a very dear colleague and friend, and we'll discuss uh, a topic that we've been, di we've been engaged in in our recent research projects in the center, in the Jamonet Center of Excellence, which is the Ergo Omnes Obligations and Compliance in Community Interest uh, Cases before the International Court of Justice. Uh, professor Sedana Forlat is Professor of International Law and Director of the Department of Law, as I said, from the University of Ferrara. She's a member of the Governing uh, Council of the Italian Society of International and European Union Law and of the uh, Scientific Advisory Board of Max Planck Institute Luxembourg for European International and Regulatory Procedural Law. 
She's former director of the Center for European Legal Studies on Macro Crime from the University of Ferrara. Uh, her lines of research include international education, international human rights law, and its relationship with uh, international criminal law. So now, Serena, please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Paola, for this kind introduction and more importantly for the um, invitation to be here uh, to participate in this very interesting conference and to visit uh, uh, this wonderful uh, institution. Um, as you also mentioned, uh, we have collaborated recently on a project uh, dealing with compliance uh, with International uh, Court of Justice's decisions. And while the presentation I am making here is, the, uh, is simply that of my own thoughts on the topic of erga omnes obligations and compliance, in community interest cases before the ICJ, I would like to gratefully acknowledge the contribution of Professor Almeidas to my own reflection on this topic today. Uh, so Professor Almeida has asked us all to discuss the possibility of a new era of international adjudication, an era where community interests are pivotal in changing the traditional structures of international adjudication. And indeed, the International Court of Justice is a privileged testing ground to assess any such transformation. On the one hand, uh, the International Court of Justice is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, as the U Article 92 of the UN Charter stipulates. It is the one international court which still, I think, more closely reflects the private law model of international dispute settlement that was typical of classic 19th century approach to dispute settlement, uh, which, to borrow the words of Robert Kolb in his general course uh, at the Hague Academy, Academy of International Law, uh, is really a matter that used to be completely submitted to and governed by the interests of the litigating states. He writes in this regard that uh, in classic uh, international dispute settlement, and I switch to French to quote him, the consideration d'intérêt général ne vient presque jamais tempérer ce face à face individualiste between the litigating states. That is, uh, uh, general interest concerns never uh, or almost never uh, um, blend in the uh, single-minded bilateral uh, confrontation between the litigating states. At the same time, uh, the very notion of obligations erga omnes, which is one of the key concepts for the transformation we are discussing, was developed by the court itself in its case law. Uh, you may remember uh, that uh, the key advisory opinion of the court on the Genocide Convention of 1951 highlighted that in the Genocide Convention specifically, the contracting states do not have any interests of their own. They merely have one and all a common interest, namely the accomplishment of those high purposes which are the raison d'etre of the Convention. And this idea that the Convention Against Genocide uh, reflects a common, a shared interest, a collective interest of the participating states and the international society more generally is underlying the whole idea of erga omnes obligations, which the court itself developed in a contentious setting later on. Why do I stress uh, the difference and the distinction between advisory opinions, advisory procedures, and contentious proceedings? Because at least in the context of the International Court of Justice, it has been traditionally easier uh, also for states and for the court itself to deal with matters concerning common general interests uh, in the framework of advisory proceedings. The way in which these interests uh, find a role and a place in contentious proceedings is far more tortuous 
and has to do specifically with a starting point, uh, the Barcelona Traction Judgment of 1970. Uh, I'm not sure that the students here are aware about this judgment, uh, which really changed the court, uh, court's approach to the problem. Um, and it was a issue, it was a case concerning uh, diplomatic protection of a company, uh, uh, um, Belgium challenged the way Spain had uh, addressed and um, dealt with this uh, company. Uh, and, uh, however, in that case, not much to do with protection of community interests or general interests of the international society, uh, the court drew uh, what it called an essential distinction, and I quote here uh, from the court's judgments, uh, judgment, between the obligation of a state towards of the international community as a whole and those arising vis-a-vis -vis another state in the field of diplomatic protection. By their very nature, the former are the concern of all states. In view of the importance of the rights involved, all states can be held to have a legal interest in their protection. They are obligations erga omnes. So it is with this passage that the notion of obligation erga omnes finds its way in international uh, law and in international legal discourse. Uh, it is worth stressing, I think, uh, that uh, this judgment uh, did not come by chance. Why did the court uh, address this kind of distinction in a case that had very little to do with erga omnes obligations and protection of general interest? Well, because a few years earlier, in 1966 specifically, the court had made a very serious faux pas. Uh, um, it had considered uh, that uh, two African states, Ethiopia and Liberia, did not have standing to challenge before the International Court of Justice the way in which South Africa had uh, exercised its position as mandate holder over Southwest Africa, uh, Namibia today, uh, on the basis of a mandate agreement uh, under the auspice, concluded under the auspices of the uh, um, uh, League of Nations. And with this uh, very formalistic uh, judgment of 1966, anchored to the traditional vision of international litigation I uh, described earlier, uh, the court lost the trust and the support of a wide range of states. Um, it was the worst crisis in the court's history, an existential crisis, it was defined by Robert Cold, I think, once again. And uh, Barcelona Traction was a reaction to this uh, uh, crisis, an attempt by the court to regain the lost ground and the uh, trust of the community of states of which it is an organ. Uh, yet, the impact of obligations set forth in the general interest on uh, international litigation and contentious co proceedings before the ICJ specifically remained unclear for many years. While some scholars, and I include myself on, among these, although I came uh, to uh, thinking about these issues much later, and of course there were discussions already in the 70s, on the impact of this judgment. Um, uh, some scholars uh, drew from the dictum of the court, it was not a key element of the decision of 1970, the conclusion that uh, an action uh, in the common interest would be possible before the ICJ, that a state could start litigation in the general interest. Uh, you know that the International Court of Justice can, and Professor Sorel has just mentioned, can hear cases only at the interstate level. Only states can bring cases before uh, the ICJ, but uh, this dictum seemed to open the possibility for states to uh, bring complaints, bring claims before the ICJ, not only to protect their own individual interests, but also uh, in order to foster the protection of uh, collective interests through the notion of our government's obligations. And uh, commentaries and also the work of the International Law Commission on uh, international responsibility of states for internationally wrongful acts seem to indicate that this would be a possibility. Uh, 
At the same time, uh, the reading of the court's judgment was controversial. Other um, scholars uh, considered that uh, another passage of the judgment uh, didn't, was not so clear on the point, and the court did not have an opportunity to clarify its uh, stance on this point for a very long time. In fact, a number of cases were brought to the court where general interests of the international community were at stake, but on the one hand, some of these cases were framed still in a rather uh, bilateral, traditional uh, um, perspective. I think, for instance, of the nuclear test cases between Australia and New Zealand and France in the early 70s, uh, 70s where uh, the problem of uh, nuclear fallouts and the impact of nuclear testing, surface nuclear testing on the environment were at stake, but uh, the cases were framed in a rather bilateral perspective. Uh, a, a setting, so to speak, uh, although st other states did try to intervene in the case, in these cases. Um, at the same time, this and other later cases uh, showed a readiness of states to take up uh, cases where community interests were involved, but there was not the possibility for the court to go into the merits of those cases. The nuclear test cases uh, were um, not uh, did not reach the merits, or better, the court considered that the dispute had become moot. And even uh, in the later connected case in the, er, in the 1990s, where uh, New Zealand sought a request for an examination of the situation uh, in light of France's decision to resume underground testing, uh, did not come to a um, decision on the merits. Um, and the same happened. In other later cases, I just briefly mention Portugal versus Australia, for instance, a case w where Portugal sought to enforce uh, the right of East Timor to self-determination, but the court considered that it did not have jurisdiction to hear the merits of the case. Um, in other situations, I think, for instance, of the Bosnia versus Serbia litigation in the 90s and uh, up to the years 2000, community interests were clearly involved, but the action uh, by the applicant state was uh, really uh, and mainly concerned with uh, what could be framed also as individual interests of the state whose nationals had been uh, and whose territory was ravaged by the civil war at the time where Serbia might have been involved. It is only um, in the last decade, a bit more than a decade, that uh, the first cases uh, concerning community, true cases brought before the court uh, in uh, uh, protection in persons of community interest uh, were heard on the merits. I refer to the 2012 judgment uh, between Belgium and Senegal, uh, to whom which Professor Sorel already made reference, uh, the questions relating to the obligation to prosecute or extradite, and later the whaling in the Antarctic case between Australia and Japan. Uh, the respondent states in those two cases did not challenge the applicant's standing on the issue. But this challenge was openly brought to the fore and before the court, formally raised by Myanmar in the Gambia versus Myanmar case, which is currently pending. Uh, in the judgment on preliminary objections of 2000 July to th uh, 22 July 2022, the court clearly and unequivocally uh, stated uh, that uh, the entitlement to invoke the responsibility of a state party to the Genocide Convention before the court before, for alleged breaches of obligations erga omnes partes derives from the common interest of all state parties in compliance with those obligations and is therefore not limited to the state of nationality of the alleged victims. So this would seem to finally close the discussion as to what Barcelona attraction actually meant if it were not for the dissenting opinion of Judge Chouet, who rather forcefully argues in her dissent that uh, the court stance is not correct because the bilateral and adversarial structure of the dispute settlement mechanism is reflected in the procedural rules of the court and that such rules are not suitable to entertain public interest actions. 
uh, and also she per puts forward a restrictive interpretation of Article 9 of the Genocide Convention, its uh, compromissory clause. But apart from this last bulwark of resistance, I would say that the issue of uh, standing of states to take action in the common interest is settled once and for all. Um, and uh, it has already been mentioned that states show an interest uh, in protection of the common interest, not only through this uh, path of taking up litigation, but also through the tool of intervention. Mainly intervention under Article 63 of the statute, uh, intervention as of right in, the case, uh, in cases where interpretation of multilateral conventions are at stake, and the Genocide Convention is definitely one of those situations, um, but also sometimes, and let, with less clear uh, patterns as regards Article 62 intervention, intervention uh, in cases where a legal interest of the state is at stake. I don't have the time uh, to uh, discuss in detail this kind of litigation, but um, uh, Professor Sorel has already mentioned the fact that 33 states have intervened um, in the um, uh, pending case between uh, Ukraine and Russia. And uh, three states have actually announced intervention in Gambia versus Myanmar. Uh, they have not taken this step formally, at least this is not public, no, uh, publicly known yet, but this might have to do with the fact that only recently the court decided on the jurisdictional phase, wh while uh, intervention in uh, Ukraine versus Russia, versus Russia also has to do with the jurisdictional aspects of the case. Uh, here, the situation is different in Gambia versus Myanmar, so maybe these interventions by the Maldives, Canada, and Australia uh, will actually take place in the near future. Uh, it remains to be seen how the court will manage these situations from a procedural point of view. Suggestions that the rules of court should be amended in order to allow for a, a light form of, lighter form of participation in proceedings, such as an emissus curiae, have not take, be, been taken up by the court so far. But it seems unlikely that the court will deem the, these declarations of intervention inadmissible in one way or the other. More generally, the court seems to be growingly ready to accept its transformation from a tool of bilateral justice to a court where also public law considerations may influence the management of contentious proceedings involving ergonomous obligations, both treaty-based obligations, such as in the cases we have just discussed, Gambia and Myanmar and Ukraine versus Russia, so ergonomous part of obligation being at stake, but possibly also uh, 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 cases involving customary international law and ergo omnis obligations established under customary international law. I don't have the time to deal in detail uh, with these other aspects of uh, new uh, trends in, in the litigation before the court, but there are other areas of procedure, for instance, the issue of time management or uh, the problems co relating to evidence uh, that uh, show the court's timid uh, readiness to consider the nature of interest at stake in addressing uh, um, these procedural issues. For instance, in addressing uh, requests for postponement of, of deadlines uh, by one of the parties, where the problem of reparation of serious human rights violation is at stake, the court in, court in Congo versus Uganda, for instance, has taken this argument to limit. Uh, its readiness to accept uh, Uganda's request for further delays in the proceedings. Also, uh, uh, there is a growing attention by the court to monitoring compliance, especially with its orders on provisional measures, with a new mechanism of monitoring entrusted to a committee of three judges that has uh, been included in the resolution on the internal judicial practice of the court in the recent past, possibly also as a reaction to the uh, Gambia versus Myanmar litigation. These new and, at least in my view, promising trends are also due, uh, if not exclusively uh, due, to the court's perception of the growing interest of states to promote this new approach to international adjudication. I'm not suggesting that the court should only act if it feels that there is uh, a state's consent to these procedural innovations. Uh, none of these steps have actually been uncontroversial. However, as with its task of elucidating and developing substantive rules of international law, 
the court knows that also from the procedural point of view, uh, it's, these developments must be attuned to the new needs of the international society, which include not only states, but also other actors and stakeholders. Uh, but it cannot lose the confidence of states as it occurred after the Southwest Africa cases of 19 and its judgment of 1966. Uh, so new trends, also because there is this readiness by states to embrace uh, a new vision of international adjud adjudication. In this respect, however, uh, there are a few caveats that should be highlighted. Uh, the uh, steps taken by the court, the fact that states take up the flags of collective interest raising complaints before the ICJ in their capacity as omnis, uh, are an important sign of involvement, but they are not enough to ensure effective protection of erga omnis uh, of the interest underlying erga omnis obligations. First of all, the readiness of states to uh, take up the flag of the common interest uh, in ICJ litigation is still rather frail. It is selective, both in terms of the group of states involved in these new practices and in terms of the cases in which these practices occur. Uh, mm, we have discussed Ukraine, Russia, and uh, Gambia, Myanmar, but there is no similar eagerness to participate in proceedings in other cases involving the common interest, uh, Palestine, United States, discussed by Professor Sorel being a good example. Also, an aspect that cannot be forgotten is whether any finding that the court may make can actually foster effective protection of uh, uh, general interest in practice whether the court's pronouncements touching upon erga omnes obligations, be they pro in provisional measures or in final judgments, are actually implemented on the ground, that is the key challenge. And the court has shown some in readiness in getting involved in the implementation, implementation phase, but it can, cannot act alone. Comple consent and readiness by states to comply with the court's pronouncements is a key aspect of uh, the international adjudication before the ICJ. This was uh, pointed out uh, by Professor Boisson de Chazour, among many other scholars, other scholars uh, very uh, clearly. And the mechanism set forth by Article 94 in the United Nations Charter for the implementation of ICJ judgments and decisions uh, is not working pro properly because it is entrusted to the Security Council. So whether the international community will take it up to ensure the implementation of the court's finding by ensuring adequate international pressure in the form of sanctions or other means of persuasion to uphold international adjudication as such as a global public good will, in my view at least, be decisive for any new era of international adjudication to actually come to life. And in this respect, we may ask not only whether the ICJ is up to the task of becoming a court really capable of upholding general interest by the developing the notion of erga omnes obligations to its full potential, so to speak, but we should also uh, question whether the international community is ready to meet the challenge of such a court. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Serena Ferlati, for your enlightening input, uh, for addressing Erga Omnes obligations and compliance in community interest uh, cases before the court. As I, as I mentioned before, this is one of our topics uh, in, uh, in, in research that uh, is undertaken by students here at FGV, and some of them are here uh, listening to you and uh, very interested in your, in your discussion. Um, so as we know, as as you mentioned, um, it, this is uh, this is a topic that is um, um, is before international is, is being is being uh, uh, left to international courts and tribunals, and we are wondering. Um, 
whether we should have uh, relaxed uh, procedural rules or other criteria in order to take into account uh, community interests uh, being, being taken to, to courts. So we know that this is, there is a tendency to address community interests before international courts and tribunals, but uh, we also know that we don't have procedural mechanisms in order to address these interests and in order to take into account uh, the interest coming from not only from states but also from other uh, non-state actors. So, so how can we tailor uh, the rules, uh, we adapt the rules of international courts and tribunals in order to ac accept participation and also uh, how far can we go in, in accepting participation without uh, hurting consensualism. Uh, so this is something that uh, we've been discussing uh, nowadays uh, and notably with the intervention of, of several states in Ukraine, Russia, and also with the intent of other states to intervene in, in, in Gambia, Myanmar, as Serena mentioned. So we have this new trend, uh, this new era of international ed education, we are dealing with community interest cases. Community interests are here to stay, and um, and uh, and and it can also be used for political to ensure political interests. So community interests are here to stay, but they can be used by states in a political way. So how can we really adapt the system, and is it? Is it good to adapt the system? How are the obstacles that we are facing in order to do that? Um, and uh, if, we is, if it's really our intention, how to ensure efficiency? So it's always the issue, right? Efficiency and uh, the la bonne administration de la justice. So we are, we are dealing with cases involving the interests of the international community, but we are uh, dealing with the states as well. So how, uh, how can it be better in order to address this issue? So this is a, a, a topic that we are discussing and we, we are very grateful that you brought this so many interesting uh, discussions and so many important topics. So now I would like to welcome our next and final uh, speaker. I don't know whether Professor Miriam Cohen is already there. Oh, thank you, Miriam, you are there. Um, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Miriam Cohen. Well, thank you, Miriam, for being here with us virtually. Um, uh, you know that you, you, you came here before and we are planning to have you here again. So thank you uh, again for, for, uh, for collaborating with the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence. And, um, and we hope that this collaboration will uh, expand with uh, your ac the activities you envisage at your chair at the University of Montreal. Uh, so, Professor Miriam Cohen uh, holds the Canada Research Chair on Human Rights and International Justice at the Université de Montréal, Faculty of Law, where she teaches and researches international law, public law, and human rights. She has published widely in these topics, uh, in these fields, including as co-author of the newest edition of the Précis de droit international public, Lexis Nexis. Uh, she is the recipient of the 2022 Scholarly Book Award of the Canadian Council on International Law and the Legal Competition Award of the Quebec Fa Bar Foundation for her book, Realizing Reparat Reparative Justice for International Crimes, published by Cambridge University Press. She has previously worked at the International Court of Justice and the International Criminal Court and has appeared as counsel before the Supreme Court of Canada and the International, and International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Uh, Professor Miriam will discuss about the contribution of right laws uh, to international dispute settlement in human rights and public interest cases. Uh, Professor Miriam Cohen, you, you may now have the floor. Thank you. Bom dia a todos. É um prazer, uma honra estar aqui com com todos. Uh, may I first start by thanking the organizers for this fabulous workshop, and in particular Professor Paulo Almeida, a dear colleague and friend for this kind invitation, as well as the distinguished speakers and uh, the participants online uh, and, uh, and in person. So I'm honored to be here and I'm delighted to be uh, speaking about uh, International Law of the Sea Tribunal's contribution to uh, dispute settlement in cases where there's a human rights or a public interest aspect. Um, I'm, I regret not being able to be at the center in Rio de Janeiro uh, my hometown, um, but uh, I hope to be there next time. 
Um, so I will start uh, sharing some uh, slides with you. Uh, see if it works. So I I believe you can see a yeah perfect. It works. So as a matter of introduction, we have heard today from excellent presentations about the transformation of international courts and tribunals, uh, which have increasingly been dealing with cases of uh, public interest, community interest, and with uh, strong human rights components. So as scholars have mentioned, the ICJ itself has played an important role um, in community interest cases and uh, such uh, cases with uh, human rights uh, aspects. Um, but what about the other inter interstate international tribunal, that is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, which I call in my presentation the ITLUS. So what is the link between the law of the sea and community interests? My presentation today will zero in on the specialized international tribunal and I shall discuss the contribution that the ITLOS has had in settling disputes in the law of the sea, but with human rights or public interest components. Um, so the aim of my presentation today is essentially to dwell upon the protection of human rights and public interest, two aspects that deserve particular attention uh, concerning uh, recent cases of uh, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and I have made uh, a selection of some cases that have human rights components and some cases that have public interest uh, uh, components uh, in order to think through uh, these uh, aspects and, and actually this current uh, uh, trend. So if we start uh, with uh, human rights and the law of the sea. So essentially human rights protection was not expressly included in the agenda of the Third Convention of uh, the United Nations Conference uh, on the Law of the Sea. And as a result of that, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, the UNCLOS, devotes very few provisions to the issue of, of human rights, as expected. Um, so these provisions include, and these are just some examples, the prohibition of imprisonment and corporal punishment for violations of the coastal states, fisheries, uh, laws in the ex exclusive economic zone, the prevention and repression of the transport of slaves by sea, the assistance and rescue in case uh, of collision at sea, the protection of human rights at sea with respect to activities in the area, amongst others. Um, so, nevertheless, this complementarity between human rights and law of the sea uh, has been seen in, uh, in recent cases of the court. So some uh, judges of the tri and, and admit that the tribunal established by UNCLOS may adopt a similar posture to that of human rights uh, institutions. For example, and I quote, human rights may be relevant to the application and interpretation of the law of the sea. The law of the sea may be relevant to the application and interpretation of human rights rules. So in the same perspective, an arbitral tribunal constituted under Annex 7 to the UNCLOS stated that the right to protest at sea derives from the freedom of expression and the freedom of assembly, both of which are recognized in several international human rights instruments. Um, so this, this approach and uh, this discussion has been also followed in the literature by uh, some distinguished authors. So then if I turn to uh, the public interest uh, in the law of the sea. So generally named uh, community interest, also known as the common interest of the of international community as a whole. So for the purposes of, of this presentation, uh, public interest can refer to a set of principles and values which transcend uh, the personal interest of states in a given case to incorporate all human beings. So in the law of the sea, uh, the UNCLOS provides that the area and its resources are inalienable because they constitute the common heritage of humankind. So the activities in the area <clears throat> must be conducted for the benefit of all mankind under the control of the International Seabed Authority. So the public interest also derives from the obligations to preserve and protect the marine env environment 
in the management and the conservation of marine living resources. So in addition to these aspects, the law of the sea is facing some new challenges as I will discuss later in the presentation by referring to one uh, specific case um, that strengthened these new challenges, strengthen the role of the ITLOs in protecting the public interest. So for example, to mention something very recent, uh, the adoption of the BBNJ Treaty, or as also known the Treaty of the High Seas, um, demonstrates the commitment of the international community to ensure the conservation and sustainable use of uh, marine biological diversity of areas be beyond national jurisdiction in the common interest. So this agreement is in addition to uh, the 1994 agreement relating to the implementation of Part 11 of UNCLOSE and the 1995 agreement for the implementation of the provisions of UNCLOSE related to the conservation and management of straddling fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks. So together they reinforce the attributions of the ITLOs in the sense of dispute settlement mechanism as uh, provided for under uh, part 15 to UNCLOS. So if I now turn uh, to the jurisdiction in relation to human rights and public interest. So it's well known that the International Tribunal of the Law of the Seas is a specialized tribunal. Uh, its specialty is the Law of the Sea uh, and mainly uh, relates to disputes uh, on the limitation, for example, of maritime zones and navigation, conservation and management of marine uh, living resources, the protection and preservation of marine environment, and marine scientific research. So clearly, ITLO's jurisdiction uh, over public interest, largely defined, uh, can be seen. However, ITLO's is not a human rights legal instrument, uh, uh, is not a human rights uh, tribunal, and the UNCLOS is not a human rights legal instrument as such. Uh, so there's, it doesn't directly give rights to individuals. So I'm looking at uh, some uh, literature in, in, in this uh, area. Um, so, the ITLO's jurisdiction in this regard is not expressly mentioned in the Montego Bay Convention or another agreement. De nevertheless, uh, the tribunal is regularly solicited to rule on questions of human rights violations uh, with the fear uh, for certain states and part of the doctrine to the extension of the jurisdiction of the tribunal to an issue that has a distinct regime than that uh, established in the own clause. Um, so, in this regard, an arbitral tribunal under Ar Annex 7 uh, to UNCLOS reiterated the autonomy of the human rights protection regime, which should not be replaced by the courts and tribunals for the law of the sea. However, uh, the, the uh, tribunal has jurisdiction over any dispute concerning the interpretation or application of the UNCLOS, so the UN Convention uh, for the Law of the Sea, and obviously that includes all human rights uh, provisions referred to uh, that I just mentioned um, and uh, Article 290 on provisional measures and Article 292 regarding the prompt release cases um, give ITLO's competence to uh, protect human rights while uh, exercising its specialized jurisdiction. So thus, uh, although the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea does not have the specific mandate in human rights, it may successfully integrate this concern to protect human rights in this uh, jurisdiction while uh, uh, and within uh, the limits uh, of their own competence. So disputes over the seizure and detention of ships invariably includes issues related to the protection of human rights. The flag state regularly requests from the tribunal either for the prescription of provisional measures, for the release of the crew of the detained vessel, pending a decision on the merits or for the prompt release of the crew after a reasonable bond or financial security has been deposited uh, in the coastal state. So as I mentioned earlier, I have selected some of the cases of, uh, that are in the docket of the tribunal to think through uh, these issues of human rights uh, principles integrated in the jurisprudence of the tribunal and also uh, public interest cases uh, that come before the tribunal. So to date, the ITLOS has 31 cases on its docket, 
and more than half of that includes directly or indirectly the arrest and detention of vessels with human rights considerations and a selective examination of these cases according uh, to the relevance of their legal scopes led me to present to you very briefly i'm conscious of time um, some uh, some cases that mention considerations of uh, human rights uh, and i will uh, be very uh, concise on the description of the facts of the case and i'm more than happy to go uh, into more detail uh, during the q a part um, of, uh, of this session so the first case that I'm uh, looking at is the Saiga, very well known. Uh, sorry, case. sorry, medium. Can you speak a little bit louder, please? Sure, uh, yeah, sure. Please. Thank you for letting me know. It's always a um, some difficult to to tell when we're participating abroad. Is this is this uh, better? Can you hear me better? I'll go perhaps a little closer to my. Yeah, to we'll my check. Side. We'll check the audio here, but we, it's fine. It's fine. Thank you. Okay, okay, fantastic. So I'll I'll uh, I'll do my my best to speak uh, very loud and clear. Um, so the first case is the Saga case, Saga case, which is is quite well known, um, where Saint Vincent and the Grenadines submitted to Itlos a request for the prompt release of the Saga and its crew. So again, uh, going directly into the into the matter uh, that uh, that I'm that I'm interested in. Pending the establishment of the Arbitral Tribunal of Annex 7 of UNCLOS, the ITLOS ruled prima facie that Guinea shall refrain from taking or enforcing any judicial or administrative measure against the saga, its master and other members of the crew, its owners or operators, in connection with the incidents leading to the arrest and detention of the vessel. So again, in its order of 1st of July, 1999, the tribunal concluded that, and I quote, Guinea used excessive force and endangered human life before and after boarding the Saiga and thereby violated the rights of Saint Vincent and the Grenadines under international law. So the Saga case revealed that the convention doesn't provide this guarantee for the protection of human rights as a human rights body. It's not meant to uh, do that. Um, but it also, uh, this case also illustrated the principle of the unit of the ship, where it was ruled that uh, consideration um, of, uh, and, and beyond this principle of, of the unity of the ship, uh, the tribunal ruled that considerations of humanity must apply in the law of the sea as they do in other areas of international law. So it's, a, it's an opter dictum here, um, which constitutes an additional, uh, perhaps, uh, fertile room for the discussion of human rights in the law of the sea litigation. So quickly turning to the second case in this selective review uh, of cases is the Juno Trader case, um, which is, again, a case about 19 members of the crew that were detained on board uh, the vessel um, and except for one that was physically injured at the time of the boarding. So here the tribunal considered that the obligation of prompt release of vessels and crews include uh, elementary considerations of humanity and due process of law. So the judges unanimously decided that Guinea-Bissau shall promptly release the Juno trader together with its cargo upon the posting of a bond and other security to be determined by the tribunal and that the crew shall be free to leave Guinea-Bissau without any conditions. So turning to the third uh, case in my study, the Arctic Sunrise case, um, here the vessel was boarded in September 2013 following an inspection conducted by the Russian authorities. The crew members were arrested and criminal prosecuted in Russian courts. And uh, turning to the decision here uh, at stake pending the constitution of an ad hoc tribunal under Annex 7 of the UNCLOS, it, the tribunal uh, ITLOS decided prima facie that the Russian Federation shall immediately release the vessel Arctic Sunrise and all persons who have been detained upon the posting of a bond or other financial security by the Netherlands. So, if we turn
turn to the fourth case, the North Star case, which uh, I uh, had the honor to, to participate as, as school counsel. It's a case that deals with uh, the arrest and detention of a Panamanian flagged oil tanker, North Star, which was detained on 27 of September 1998 by the Spanish authorities following instructions from Italian authorities based on mutual legal assistance on the grounds that it was allegedly engaged in offshore bunkering uh, mega yachts activities. So uh, fast forwarding on uh, 16th of November 2015, 17 after, uh, years after the event, Panama submitted a claim to the Tribunal for Compensation for the Damages suffered by the owner and charter of the North Star um, due to inter alia here, uh, the loss of the vessel and its cargo and the prosecution of the master and individuals involved in the vessel's operations. So uh, Panama, based on the dictum that I mentioned uh, earlier in the Saga case, argue that by filing charges against the persons having an interest in the operations of the Panamanian vessel, Italy has breached the rules of international law, such as those that protect the human rights and fundamental freedoms of the persons involved in the operation of the uh, North Star. So this case uh, raised the issue of evidence of human rights violations in the law of the sea uh, litigation uh, aspect, and uh, it also highlighted uh, how it can be difficult to demonstrate violations of uh, human rights, uh, especially in cases that uh, dates from uh, a long, uh, long uh, time ago, and where uh, um, there were uh, difficulties in uh, in accessing uh, the vessel. So, if I turn now uh, to the third case, the San Pedro Pio case, um, a Swiss flagged vessel that was boarded by Nigerian authorities while engaged in ship to ship transfers of gas oil in Nigeria's exclusive economic zone, the EEZ. So, here, uh, Switzerland invokes the violation by Nigeria of Article 58 of UNCLOS, read in conjunction of Article 87 and 92. And uh, it also invoked the violation of the right to seek reparation uh, uh, for damages on behalf of the crew, as well as rights under uh, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights and the Maritime Labor Convention, as well as customary international law. So here the tribunal uh, ordered uh, that Nigeria uh, shall immediately release the San Padre Pio, its cargo and the master and the three officers uh, and shall ensure that the San Padre Pio and its cargo uh, are allowed, uh, its cargo and the master and three officers are allowed to leave the territory and maritime areas under the jurisdiction of Nigeria. And finally, in this uh, first category of cases that bring forward some human rights uh, violations and some aspects of human rights, uh, I'll discuss the detention of three Ukrainian naval vessels, um, which uh, is a more recent case. In this case, Ukraine contends that by detaining the above uh, vessels, um, so Bern, uh, the uh, Bernstek, Nikopol, and Yanni Kapu, uh, three Ukrainian vessels. So here uh, it's uh, submitted that the, Ukraine, the Russian Federation violated Articles 30, uh, 32, 58, 95, and 96 of UNCLOS, which confer immunity from uh, police uh, jurisdiction and legislation. Um, also, Ukraine argued that the detention of the Ukrainian military personnel constitutes a violation of their rights and those of uh, their family members. So in this case, it was ordered prima facie that the Russian Federation shall immediately release the 24 detained Ukrainian servicemen and allow them to return to uh, Ukraine. So I'll turn now to a quick look at some selective uh, cases on uh, concerning public interest. So the protection of the common, common interest has been implicitly addressed in two uh, ITLO's cases on the protection and preservation of the marine environment. So the first case is the MOX plant uh, case, and the second is related to this, the case concerning uh, the rec land reclamation by Singapore in and around the Straits of Johar. And we also have the protection of common interest uh, addressed in the advisory opinion of the sub 
Regional Fisheries Commission, and uh, uh, finally the uh, very recent and um, highly attended uh, the advisory opinion of the Small Island States Commission on Climate Change and International Law. And this uh, latter case deals uh, on uh, with the implications of climate change for the protection and preservation of the marine environment, uh, cert, uh, raising issues of common interest uh, protection. So the first case, uh, the case of the MOX plant, um, it deals with the treatment of nuclear fuel uh, waste. And in this case, uh, uh, the tribunal notes that the obligation to cooperate in the preservation and protection of the marine environment is fundamental and gives relevant reasons for the prescription of provisional measures different from those uh, requested by Ireland. Um, I should also note here that the protection and preservation of the marine environment involves issues that transcend uh, the protection of the personal rights of states and may therefore give the tribunal the power to prescribe some provisional uh, me measures um, proprio motu. Um, so, if I just go quickly uh, to the land reclamation, reclamation in and around the Straits of Rahor uh, to try and, and not uh, exceed my time uh, by, by too much. Um, in this case, the uh, tribunal recalling its jurisprudence in the Mox plant case on the fundamental character of the obligation to cooperate exactly. uh, to conserve and protect the marine environment ordered the states to establish a group of experts. I'm sorry, medium just just one thing, just to ask you to summarize, if you can, the presentation, because we are almost running out of time and yes. we won't have time <laughs> for questions afterwards. I realize that. Okay, um, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll just finalize with, uh, with this uh, one case and some concluding thoughts, if I may. Um, so it ordered the states to establish a group of experts to conduct an environmental impact assessment within a year. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are two interesting uh, advisory opinions. The first one, which had a, a question for what are the rights and obligations of the coastal state in ensuring the sustainable management of shared stocks and stocks of common interest. And here uh, the court, the tribunal mentioned the application to seek to agree and the obligation to cooperate um, that are due diligence obligations. And of course, uh, the advisory opinion on Commission of Mo Small Island States uh, on climate change and international law. So here dealing with the consequences of climate change for the preservation and protection of the marine environment. And here notably concerning uh, ocean warming, sea level rises and ocean acidification. Um, so it's a pending case uh, that we'll, uh, we'll shall see what the court decides. Um, so some just concluding thoughts uh, here. What can we what can we conclude from this uh, brief review of cases that have public interest or human rights component? So the ITLOs can contribute to uh, the protection of human rights, and sometimes uh, even when adopting a strict uh, strict jurisdictional approach, it has regularly ordered the immediate release of the crew of a boarded vessel or their unconditional liberty to leave the territory under the jurisdiction of the coastal state. Um, and then the principle of unity of the vessel is also highly relevant, relevant as, as it allows the flag state to assume responsibility for violation of the rights of persons on board of a vessel flying its flag re regardless of uh, their nationality. And very importantly, uh, the tribunal is willing or uh, may consider compensation for questions that deal with human rights violations of crew, for example, when requested by the flag state, provided that there is evidence uh, of, of such. In regards to the protection of public interest, we have seen that the tribunal has already had a significant role and continue to do so, I would submit, uh, whether it's, it is to clarify the obligations of states regarding, for example, the obligation to cooperate in the protection and preservation of the marine environment, or to clarify the issues raised by recent developments in the law of the sea. And we see here the sea level rise climate change. So this review of the jurisprudence shows that there is this tendency in the jurisprudence of the tribunal to look at issues that go beyond uh, its very specialized jurisdiction and touch on human rights protection and public interest. 
It is and remains a specialized interstate tribunal uh, where uh, it deals with very uh, specific questions of international uh, law and law of the sea specifically. Um, but and, and in this regard, uh, it, it might not be uh, comparable to the ICJ, but my submission based on this uh, empirical review of cases is that it's increasingly playing a role in uh, human rights protection and, and community or public interest. So thank you very much. I will stop here to uh, not uh, delay further the uh, Q&A questions. And muito obrigada. Uh, I look forward to all uh, questions and comments. Muito obrigada, Miriam. Thank you very much uh, for, for this uh, interesting talk, presenting an overview of, of uh, human rights, uh, of cases involving human rights and also community interests or public interests before it laws. Um, you gave examples um, in the case law, you discussed the challenges, and nowadays we have a big challenge concerning uh, this new advisory opinion on climate change, and it remains to be seen how the tribunal is going to uh, treat and decide on questions about uh, uh, international law and interaction in different fields of international law. So I would like to open the floor for questions. You know, we, we, are, uh, we are running out of time. As you know, we are almost at, we, we, we were supposed to, uh, to finish before, uh, half an hour before, but um, I think that we could collect at least two questions from the audience and two questions from, uh, from those who are participating online. So that we can, uh, the, uh, and then you can uh, identify the speaker and ask concise questions, please, so that we are able to answer um, in, you know, not, not exceeding too much our time here. Uh, so we can start with the audience there, and then we can go online to see uh, the ones who are interested in asking questions. Now we have three, four, oh, four, five. <laughs> no. So we'll start with uh, with the uh, who, with this with these ones, right? Well, not six. Not we won't be able to answer them all. Well, uh, Pedro, please, you can start, so we can pick up two and uh, and then from online. Yes, please. Thank, thank, thank you, Professor. I have a question for Professor Arroyo, and um, it concerns um, diversity in arbitration. Um, you spoke that one of the um, ways arbitral institutions are uh, tackling the current challenges in international arbitration are perhaps uh, making the, the arbitral tribunals a more diverse environment. My question concerns amicus curiae and especially amicus curiae in investment arbitration. What do you think is the role of amicus curiae in investment arbitration in dealing with these challenges of legitimacy? And what are the dangers of allowing uh, said participation uh, in investment arbitration? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I am not sure that I was referring to that when I talk about uh, diversity. I, I could put the, the participation of, of uh, Amicus Curie rather uh, in, uh, in the part of transparency taken as uh, accessibility. You know? I, I mean, the possibility for the civil society to be somehow engaged in cases uh, between uh, states and, and, and investors. Um, well, in, in the last years, uh, I think there was a great advance uh, in the sense that um, the now we have rules, we have rules in, in the in the um, exit rules, and we have in, in general uh, for the the rest of investor state arbitration normally are conducted uh, the, uh, by uh, under the, the the rules of UNCITRAL, and uh, UNCITRAL has its own development on, on rules of transparency, including. Um, uh, amicus curious participation, and that is a, a, um, a great responsibility for the arbitral tribunal. Uh, I, I have, as an arbitrator, the, the, the tendency to accept the, 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 those persons, but sometimes, uh, um, you know, when, when those persons are 
harsh activists, the, the risk uh, for, for the, mm, you know, for uh, the having problems, introducing problems uh, in, in the, um, uh, in, into the, the proceedings is high. So the, the arbitral tribunal must uh, make um, many assessments before accepting, and once uh, uh, a third party is accepted, uh, the arbitral tribunal has always had uh, the control of that. Of course, that costs money because there are submissions, there are time, the, so that there are cost, and, and the money must be paid by the parties, and in, uh, including the state. Uh, so the, the, that is a big responsibility that uh, the arbitral tribunal must deal with. But in, as a very mm, great, uh, big uh, answer or general answer, uh, I think it's a good thing in general uh, to have at least the, the opportunity. Then maybe in a case it's better to reject uh, if you don't see that uh, all the elements are, are fulfilled in order to accept that particular uh, requesting party. But uh, as a whole answer, I think it's a, it's a very good thing to, to have the opportunity that to, to have the civil society somehow engage in what is happening in, in this dispute between the states and, and investors. Thank you. So Hassan, we'll have one more question, and uh, the other ones will be able to ask questions during the, the coffee break, please. Yeah. So uh, my question is also regarding uh, for Professor Arroyo as well, and it's regarding a similar topic, so it's going to be connected there. Um, what do you think is the opportunity and the challenges as well for um, business and human rights claims and business and human rights interests in uh, uh, international arbitration. Is it possible to advance on that direction even uh, with uh, uh, more clauses on, there on the international uh, covenants for, for arbitration? Uh, what is your position on that? What are the trends, possible trends? Hassan, if you can already ask your question, so we will stop with you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Uh, First, uh, thank for thank all the professors for the amazing presentations, the wonderful presentations. Uh, my question is aimed at uh, Professor Serena. Uh, what ca could you elaborate further on the theoretical framework of what would be uh, community interests? I know, I know Judge uh, former Judge Sima uh, ha had a, a concept. Uh, what what in your views? Uh, what are the categories and? Uh, uh how can the ICJ implement these community interests? Uh, um, uh, on your question, I think there are a, a, a big room for um, for introducing human rights considerations in, uh, in arbitration, and that is already the case. There are many cases, and not only investment, also uh, so-called commercial cases in which there are um, human rights um, Issues involved. Um, if we take human rights in the in the in the largest uh, uh, notion, uh, there are many cases, and actually arbitration is is, is uh, really key in this moment to deal, for example, with issues related with environment uh, or other um, very general public goods, uh, and. Uh, uh, I think is uh, in general we can say it is um, the assessment. If we can do a general assessment, I, there are many cases uh, and there are very different one to each other. But I think that in general, the the how the things are going on uh, is the, the result is um, rather positive, and I say that. Um, because uh, what, I, what I can see in, in cases in which I am involved or in cases I, I have access uh, to the result, there is more and more and, and, and uh, sensitiveness uh, in, in parties are in arbitrators and not necessarily regarding with the intervention uh, of uh, non-litigants or uh, third parties. Uh, of course, transparency, as, as I mentioned before, is a very good element for that. So, because that permits the 
the public in general, state, uh, NGOs, international organizations, uh, to be aware of what is happening there. And, and that is very good. I am not saying that if it is not transparency, the, the parties and the arbitrators will try to do uh, the illicit things or, or to, to um, prejudicate human rights. But it is better if we have the, the, the windows open and the windows open and, and everybody can, can look uh, at the interior and, and to have an opinion and to have some, we can say, pressure. Okay, it's not necessarily a bad thing when the, there are very important interests uh, at stake. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, Serena, please. Thank you for your question. I don't think I can give you a complete answer in the very limited time I have. If we look at community interest th through the lens of erga omnes obligations uh, and that concept, uh, well, here we do not have a, a closed list of topics that can be covered by that, such obligations. The ICJ itself gave some examples in Barcelona Traction, um, human rights, uh, prohibition of aggression, and um, uh, principles and rules of uh, protecting the human person, and so on. Today, we certainly would include protection of the environment. Uh, the court came to that uh, later, and uh, also the uh, case law of uh, ITLOS is exemplary, it testifies to this. Um, also, self-determination is clearly covered by the notion of ergonomous obligations. Uh, we have uh, this discussion, and Judge Sima is more of the idea that I think that uh, use, um, ergonomous obligations and use Kogans are two, co uh, two faces of the same coin. There could also be the possibility of look, and it is my perspective, of looking at ergonomous obligations as a broader circle, where uh, peremptory rules are a sort of uh, cover a closer, uh, as more limited uh, kind of interest. Then, of course, you could look at community interest in a broader way. Think of the whole discussion about global commons, about whether, uh, for instance, uh, institutional uh, regimes such as international adjudication in itself could be viewed as a, a global common, so as a matter of common interest. I think that is also a very interesting perspective and not something I would discard altogether, but maybe it is not something that is covered by the erga omnes uh, uh, obligations uh, concept that I was discussing in my case. So there can be multiple answers to your question, I think, depending on the point of view. Thank you, Serena. Now, now we have two more questions from uh, from the online participants. Maybe we can go fast with this and see if you would like to answer them. Uh, so the context in which commercial arbitration was created has virtually disappeared. About the modern, uh, postmodern arbitration uh, era, how do you think that this process will evolve in the next few decades? So this is t for Diego. And there is another one to Serena. Uh, so in face of the struggle of, of the state's role to litigate in the name of community interest, may it be the case of broadening access to the ICJ as well? You may start, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the question. Well, uh, it is very difficult to, to, to make uh, predictions. Uh, what I say at the end is there are uh, um, Existential, uh, existentialist uh, option for the um, for arbitration now, and I think the the so-called arbitration community, the arbitration epistemic community, has the possibility to um, really to make a transformation of arbitration in the sense that is needed now to to deal with current uh, worries, current um, uh, um, requests of the society in, in, in general. I think many are trying to do so. Uh, institutions, uh, international institutions, uh, international, international organizations, but I think that the, 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 the whole arbitration community must uh, take this into account you know, in order to, um, to continue to offer something that I think is very good. It's very good and, and in, in all levels, commercial, uh, between the states and particulars, uh, between the states. Uh, I think it's, it's, um, it's a very, very good mechanism that has 
proven to be very efficient and, and very useful, uh, but we cannot uh, continue to, to, to work as it was made in the past when there was just an option only used for some actors. That is now it is really a very important tool used by many actors, uh, publics and private, and, and uh, the arbitrator must be at, at that level, no, cannot be given a, a middle way answer. Thank you, thank you very much, Diego. Serena. On, uh, on the possibility of broadening access to the ICJ, uh, this is a much discussed um, problem, uh, particularly the idea that intergovernmental organizations should have access to contentious jurisdiction of the court is something that has been brought up again and again. And also, uh, of course, the possibility of participation by individuals and other non-state actors has been discussed. I think, for instance, of uh, the Germany versus Italy case, number one, uh, the lawyers for the victims of Nazi crimes in Italy have advocated quite fiercely that it is completely um, unsatisfactory in the perspective of the victims not to be able to address the courts themselves but having to rely on the defenses of a state that was not perceived as fully committed to the protection of their interests. Uh, this said, uh, I do not see any change in that regard coming any time soon. Uh, for intergovernmental organizations, there has been the possibility of using advisory opinions and advisory jurisdiction as a way to bypass the limitation to uh, the court's uh, reach in terms of Article 34 of the statute, um, and that is not completely satisfactory, but it is a something. Um, to change the statute, one would need actually to amend the UN Charter, that the procedure is the same, and we know that this is politically deemed to be simply unfeasible. So anything that we have to think of has to come in by way of an amendment to the rules of court, to judicial practice of the court, but not a change in the statute, at least for the time being. And without a change in the statute, broadening this, the, the access to the court is not possible. Thank you very much. I'm afraid our time is over, but you can ask your questions uh, during the coffee break, please. Uh, uh, so thank you very much. Thank you, the speakers, for motivating this thought-provoking discussion and the audience for participating very enthusiastically. So thank you very much. And uh, now we have the lunch break, and we'll come back uh, around before 3 for, the, for panel 2 on working with large databases on courts. Thank you very much.